What are some scary and true paranormal encounters you have had? People in the woods. I want to preface this by saying I was pretty young when this happened, about 10 years old, so my memory might be a little off. My grandma used to come stay with my family sometimes during the summer to watch me and my siblings while my parents were at work. We lived in a massive house with 8 sliding glass doors surrounding by about 20 acres of woods, with a main road about a half mile away. So one night, my parents decided to go out after work and it was just myself and my grandma at the house. It was getting dark, and we were hanging out in the kitchen while she cooked. I looked up at my grandma and she was staring out the window pretty intensely. I asked her what she was looking at and she told me to look myself because she was getting older and her vision wasn't great. On the hillside behind my house I saw what looked like 5-6 small people sitting on the hill staring right at the house. They were all dressed in dark colors, and they weren't moving at all. She asked me if I saw them too and when I said yes she immediately locked all the upstairs doors and rushed me into the master bed. Top floor on the same side of the house. She was in a panic and called my dad. While I checked the window to see if they were still there. Two of them were now standing up and had moved about 20 feet closer house. Probably about 50 feet away from the ground floor sliding doors. While the other few were still sitting and staring. She told me to stay quiet and get in the closet as my dad was on his way home. We got out the shotgun and sat there for about a half hour. When my dad got home he told us nobody was in the woods and everything was fine. Now I would say this could just be kids trespassing but we had no neighbors with kids anywhere near us. We had bobbed wire fencing around most of the property and it'd be very hard to get back to the house any other way than the driveway. Also, these people or things were small, probably 4 feet tall, and I think they were wearing gowns. I don't know how to explain this or what I saw, but any explanation would be appreciated. I remember being somewhere before I was born. I have a very vivid memory about being in this very wide and open plain of white grass, or clouds, something white with the sky being blue. I remember being approached by a glowing or bright figure. Not sure if they said something but I do remember having a feeling of needing to jump somewhere. Then I remember falling and being taken out of my mother via c-section. I honestly doubt it's a dream because there's no way my mind which was barely even used could conjure up something like that. You know? Part of me thinks it was a god of some sort. Not necessarily the Christian god, but some sort of higher being. Telling or showing me it was my time. What do you guys think? I went to rehab in what was previously an old folks home. Knocking in my room all night long all over the room. Freezing cold spots. As if coming off drugs isn't bad enough. Pishach. I am a web developer with good skills in sketch art and painting. So in 2019, I moved to an apartment in Porto, Portugal where I lived alone. One afternoon I was watching some random videos on YouTube. And in one video, there was a woman who claimed that she can talk to the dead, and can teach her audience how to do it. I was bored, so I said, let's try it, what could happen? When I did what she said, suddenly I felt this strange energy going through me, but I didn't think much about it at the time. I went to sleep that night, and I dreamed of a cat. I was in my old room, and the cat climbed on my bed and started to attack me, and I fought back, but the cat suddenly disappeared, and all the electrical devices in my room, computer, TV, lights, clock, were turning on and off automatically. I panicked and looked at the digital wall clock, and it said 3 a.m., and right next to the clock, on the left side, there was something written in black, kind of a weird symbol. I woke up, all in a cold sweat, and looked at the time, and it showed 3 a.m., exactly. The next day in the evening, I was thinking about last night's dream, and I remembered the symbol which was right next to the clock and I was able to draw it, thanks to my art skills. The symbol in my dream was, I was trying to figure out what does it means. Then I took out my phone and scanned my drawing on the Google Lens app. It started showing search results related to that. From the search results, I came to know that the symbol which was near the clock in my dream was a word from the language Hindi, a language from India. The word, pronounced as Pishach, is a demon in Indian mythology. And I have never heard anything about Pishach before this incident and I have very minimal knowledge about India and its culture. From the internet I came to know that these demons, Pishach, are believed to feed on the flesh of the dead, usually inhabiting graveyards and places associated with death and dirt. 
It can possess minds, instantly driving the victim to insanity. I had terrible nightmares for a month, and I was afraid of sleeping. My health started degrading as I was not able to get enough sleep. I wasn't able to focus on my job as well. And sometimes I used to feel a weird negative energy around me randomly like there is someone else with me. I didn't used to believe in ghosts and spirits. But this incident changed my perception about all this. A friend of mine, who follows Christianity, gave me a holy cross. Since then, I sleep with that next to my bed even though I am an atheist and I have never had a nightmare since then. But I am still afraid of sleep and dark. Interesting and bizarre phenomena occurring in my old home? Let me just preface things with the fact that I'm a skeptic. I'm the guy who is slow or unwilling to believe in the paranormal. But in recent weeks, I'm starting to change this outlook. My wife and I recently moved into an older house. It was just completely renovated as it had been abandoned for approximately 2 years. I'm a college student so we don't have a lot of money currently. The home was originally built in the 1960s and its age shows. We live alone. So, ever since we moved in my wife, and many of our friends family who occasionally visit, have heard faint but clear footsteps seeming to originate from other parts of the house. I originally chalked it up as rodents in the attic, but there are times where we can clearly hear solid and distinct footsteps. I'll go and check all the rooms of the house to find nothing. And no, we don't use any drugs or psychedelics. I'm a part-time paramedic and reservist in the military, I'd be thrown out if I did. The footsteps never really bothered me, being the skeptic that I am. I just refused to believe it to be paranormal and continued to believe there was a logical or scientific explanation. But in the last week, there have been events occurring in the house that have started to make me believe our house is truly experiencing something paranormal. One morning, for example, as I am getting up for work at 4.30am in the morning, my wife and I are sitting on the bed talking about the day ahead. All of a sudden, we hear the distinct footsteps and then hear our microwave and the nearby kitchen beep a few times then start. I immediately walk to the kitchen, thinking a local transient person broke into our house, to find the microwave on and counting down from 6-16 seconds. I turn it off and check the house. All of the doors and windows are locked, and our hypersensitive pitbull is sound asleep in his bed. The second unusual event happened this morning, prompting me to make this post. Again, I am waking up for work at 4.30am. My wife wakes up with me, as she usually does, and we start to discuss our plans for the day. Mid-conversation, we hear those distinct but faint footsteps followed by what sounded like a bowl being placed or dropped on our kitchen table. I again immediately walk out to discover two of our bowls are placed down onto the floor of the kitchen, and one of the cabinets being open. And again, all of the door's windows are shut and locked. I'd like to think there is a logical explanation for this all. The house is old, and according to our next door neighbor, a squatter lived in the house until he died from an OD. So perhaps this is relevant with what we are experiencing, if this is indeed paranormal. What are your thoughts? I volunteered after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and there was something there that still scares me to this day. Okay, here it goes. I have a medical background and a certification I rarely use though I keep going back and paying to renew it. Anyhow, I volunteered almost immediately thinking I would help those who have lived through Katrina. That was not the case. There were a few of us who are assigned once the water started to recede, to find houses that had dead bodies in them. If you've ever had to do a body recovery when it has been lying around in the heat and the water for days, sometimes weeks at a time, you know how it smells. It does sort of smell like any other dead carcass but worse. I can't explain it, maybe somehow, sweeter smelling. Anyway, the key to not vomiting when you smell them is vixen under and around the bottom of your nose. It doesn't keep all the smell out but enough until you can at least tolerate the smell without vomiting. We had to go to each house and go inside in wading boots and look for bodies. Many of them washed out to sea but some were still in the houses they had lived in prior to the hurricane. If we found a body, we spray painted a big X on the outside of the house. This other guy and I had been doing it for a while and we got assigned each other almost every day. We got along okay and he didn't vomit at the ones that had been gotten to. We came up to this one old shack. I say shack because it was pretty run down and in what had been a very bad neighborhood. Right away, I got chills down my spine. 
I knew there was something really wrong. Not like find a body kind of wrong, but chilling kind of wrong. New Orleans has certain areas that just give off these vibes and my understanding is there is a lot of voodoo practiced in certain areas. Anyway, against everything my body was screaming at me. We went in the house. The first thing I could smell was a body. The second was something almost earthy and mold. I looked at my partner. I will call him Jay. He was white as a sheet. I could tell he was getting that same feeling I had been getting. It was obvious from the weird bones hanging from the ceiling. I would bet money they were cats. Something odd had been going down in the house as well as strange beads and carvings in the bare wood in the walls. We went into what was a kitchen and there chained to her beam was an old lady or what was left of her. She had chained herself by her wrist to the beam. Her guts were falling out on the floor. The creepiest thing was her face still looked as though she were alive and staring at us with a wicked smile showing only partial teeth. They were nubs. My skin started crawling as the goosebumps spread over my body and my neck hair stood up. Suddenly, I heard the most unearthly cackling noise I have ever heard in my life and my flight or fight kicked in. Jay and I noped out of there. We quickly painted the X and literally ran to the next house. Now I don't know if that old lady had practiced voodoo or whatever, but that scared the ever-living crap out of me. It still gives me nightmares. The people I feel sorry for are the ones who had to take that crazy lady out of there. Jay and I discussed it that night after we went back to the hotels north of there. He had heard the cackling too but we both said it had to be the wind or something. Got lost in the woods for 8 plus hours as a little girl, and saw something unexplainable. I grew up in a densely forested rural area in central Virginia, and like most kids my age, 10, at the time of this story, I spent a lot of time playing in and around the woods. My best friend and I had found a creek one day while exploring different deer trails through the woods. This creek we happened on was a very rare find and the perfect spot for us to play. It was wide and deep enough to swim around in and had nice, soft mossy banks on either side to rest on after we had tired ourselves out. The water was cool and clear, no copperheads, and no mosquitoes because the water was constantly running. We were psyched. After a few hours of swimming we had to walk back home for lunch but made plans to pack lunch the next day so we could have a picnic on the creek banks and spend the whole day there. The next morning we set out for the woods at around 1pm, planning to have the picnic first and swim after. We entered at the same spot we had the previous day and followed what we thought was the same deer trail. It was not. At the point where we should have found the creek, we walked into a small clearing that was covered in huge, thick ferns. We had definitely never walked past this before. So... Being both hungry and tired of walking, we decided to eat in the clearing. We laughed and played around there for a while, spitting watermelon seeds at each other from our lunch. It was an absolute blast and we were both in wonderful, giddy moods. That all changed. However, as soon as we packed up and set back out to find the creek, as we walked on the woods started to feel darker and colder. We got skittish and I noticed my friend kept whipping her head around to look behind us. After about a half hour of walking we came up on what looked like an entire overgrown bathroom. A sink, toilet, and bathtub all sitting arranged together and covered in ivy. It's pretty common to find weird crap like this in the middle of the woods. So we just walked on and made jokes to lighten the mood, calling it Bigfoot's bathroom. After another hour of walking and not seeing anything we recognized, we started to panic. Instead of trying to reach the creek we were now just trying to find our way back home or out of the woods. At least, I told her we should follow the sun and eventually we would come up on a road or someone's property where we could find help. She insisted on another way and we began yelling at each other out of fear and, let's be honest, little girl bossiness. I told her if she thought she was so right she should just go her way and we would see who got out first. So we split up. Now as an adult I fully acknowledge I was being a stubborn brat, and also, an idiot. Worst possible thing we could have done. Not 10 minutes after splitting up I began to hear someone walking maybe 100 feet behind me. Thinking it was my friend deciding to go my way after all, I slow down so she can catch up to me. Instead, whatever was matched my pace. I slow down, it slows down, I stop, it stops. This went on for hours. The whole time I was going back and forth on whether or not it was in my head or there was really something following me. I picked up a big stick, swung it a few times to make sure it was sturdy if I had to hit someone, and trucked on. As it began to get dark, 
I came up on something that made my heart sink into my stomach. It was Bigfoot's bathroom. I had just walked in a huge circle. For hours, despite being 100% sure I was following the setting sun west the entire time. Confused and frustrated, I sat down on a log and just screamed my little heart out while smacking my hooper stick repeatedly into the ground. As I tried to collect myself, I heard the footsteps again walking up on me from behind. I called out my friend's name as loud as I could, no answer. Then, after a short pause, the steps began to run towards me. I jumped up and booked it fast as I could in the opposite direction. Now, this is the truly horrifying part which I typically omit while telling people this story. As I was sprinting through the darkening woods, I began to hear what I thought were church bells. I looked up to see the darkest, deepest cloud I have even seen in my life. In the middle it was so black it was like looking into the night sky, and the dark grey around it seemed to be swirling. It gave me a horrible feeling to look at, almost like the nausea you get when looking through binoculars too long. What sickened me further is that I realized the sound of the bells was coming through the hole in the cloud. They were deafeningly loud. I mean really booming out of this thing. When I realized this I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a sense of absolute and overwhelming dread that has gone unmatched in all my 24 years on this planet. Something in my head began screaming that if I did not run away from whatever the heck that cloud was no one would ever see me again, I would be gone. I did not want to run toward the thing chasing behind me either though, so I made a sharp right and took off away from both. It was now completely dark and I was running blind through the woods, smacking through branches, wheezing, and tripping every few feet for what seemed like another hour, until I smacked into something low and flew over it. Hitting the ground so hard all the air in my lungs was knocked out of me. As I lay there trying to recover, I realized I couldn't hear the bells anymore. Then my eyes adjusted more to the dark, and I realized what had just made me go butt over teeth was an old fence. Grabbing hold of it I prayed it would lead me to a farm, and sure enough it did. I walked up over a hill about a mile to the back of the farmhouse, explained what had happened, and the farmer graciously gave me a ride back home. I was covered head to toe in scrapes oozing blood, and more exhausted than I had ever been in my life, but I was finally safe. It was past 9pm when I finally walked through my front door. My friend had gotten back shortly after we split and figured I had as well, so hadn't told anybody I was lost, and my family just figured I was still out after dark, which wasn't uncommon for me. They were shocked when I walked in beat up and crying. Nobody had been looking for me at all. To this day I wonder how long they would have waited to come find me if I hadn't been lucky enough to find the fence, and if it would have been too late. Unless they wanted you to light the candle for them, like the offerings. My son knows things he shouldn't. I have four sons. My oldest is six and he's the one I'm curious about. Since he was very young, first learning to talk, he's occasionally said things that don't make any sense for him to know. We were on vacation with my in-laws at the beach when he was 2.5 and he had a blast in the water with my husband and I. The next day, we got up bright and early to go back and he adamantly refused. He kept insisting that there were alligators in the water. We tried to reason with him that alligators didn't live in salt water, but he wasn't having it. Well, my husband had taken one of our twins, almost a year old, into the water and they were playing. A few moments later, a man comes running from the pier yelling at him to get out of the water and for us to get away from the water. He explained that while watching the water from the pit, he saw an alligator just underneath the water, stalking my husband from a distance. He called 911 and animal control arrived and were eventually able to locate and capture the alligator. It was 8 feet long. There had been storms during the night and it was mating season. The explanation was that he was looking for a mate and had come in through a freshwater river that runs into the sea. But, how could my son have known about that hours before it happened? Another time, I was going outside to do yard work and he told me not to go near the bushy tree, fig tree, because there was a rattlesnake under it. I thought it was just childhood imagination. I'm doing the yard work and I go over to that tree to see if any figs are ripe and I heard the rattle. I looked down and I was about 3 feet away from a rattlesnake and it wasn't happy to see me. I quickly got away as not to disturb it further and hope it would go on its way. He shouldn't have known it was there. Another time, we were going to go visit my mom and he was asleep. We hadn't told him where we were going because she had a surprise for him. We got in the car and he said, 
You can't go this way to grandma's because the bridge is out. We always went that way if my husband was driving and the bridge had been fully operational the day before. Sure enough, we get to the bridge and it's tapped off with a detour sign. There's no way he should have known because word hadn't gotten out yet. Especially since my cousin is the local supervisor and he didn't tell anyone about it until after I called him I honestly find this all a little creepy because I can't logically explain it. Something my daughter told me terrifies me. This past year my family went on a sabbatical in another country. My daughter, 4, talks a lot about returning to our old house and something she said recently gave me chills. Daughter, when we go back, can I sleep in mommy's room? Me, no backbone. Yes, sometimes we can have sleepovers. But don't you remember, you have a huge bed to sleep in in your room. All your toys are in there, your stuffed animals. Daughter, but that guy, remember, I wake up at night because he's there with me. Me, mentally freaking out. What? No I don't remember. What man? Daughter, he sits in the corner. He's all black. He doesn't talk he just sits by me. Me, what? What does his face look like? Daughter, he has no eyes, but I think he has a mouth. Me, in shock. Well, you can definitely sleep in my room. What the frick is that? Also how is she so nonchalant about some terrifying thing in her room like this? I finally messaged my landlord asking about the ghost. He never had tenants talk about hauntings. I go on, telling him about Francis, the name I made up for my ghost roommate. He stops me mid-sentence because Francis used to own the house and lived here decades ago. Haunting. Backstory list of paranormal events. Months back on a Sunday I was having a nightmare where I was yelling for someone to leave and they wouldn't. I wake up to see this cloud of mist at the foot of my bed and it just glides out of the room. Whole time I'm watching I'm just like oh cool it's leaving then it dawned on me what I saw and got spooked. But obvs there are a dozen ways to argue that didn't happen. So although I know what I saw I was like a hey, not worth it. My thermostat is in my living room. I know the consistent temp of my apartment. Even through the night because I do a decent amount of all nighters. Big thing with ghosts is they have a cold presence. On Sundays I'll always wake up sweating buckets with the furnace running constantly as though the thermostat is measuring the house as really cold. But this only happens on Sunday nights. A while back my friend is over and I just addressed the ghost being like hey let's set some ground rules. What's your name? Francis? Am I call you Francis? I don't mind you but you can't be messing with me ruining my sleep schedule. The random intense furnace stuff stops, but still, someone could say it was all in my head. Selective stuff or some logical debunking. I will casually talk to Francis just when I get home from work hey Francis I'm home or whatever. Kinda funny, Sunday, before the start of my 3 day overnight shifts I go yo Francis I'm gonna be doing overnights the next 3 nights so you got the place to yourself. No parties though. Tuesday night, my same friend is over and I'm running late for work by at least a half hour. Clearly Francis is kinda salty cause I'm not giving him the space I told him. My friend can't find their socks anywhere while I'm getting ready for work. Get this, I go to the bathroom to brush my teeth and their socks are up on the shelf in my bathroom. I'm like WTF Francis moved your socks. There is no way in heck those socks were there before. I was in the bathroom earlier that night and they were not there and my friend never went to the bathroom the whole time they were over. That's the most unexplainable experience of it all. When I am leaving my driveway, my car always shines its light through the back door window all the way to the door of my downstairs neighbors. I'm nosy so I always peer through. That night I didn't but my friend did and jumps in their seat swearing they saw a pale old man staring at them through the window. I didn't see it, so it still could be brain playing tricks along with a trick of the light although I've never had a weird glare or reflection any time I look through that window. So the next morning I have the convo that's described in the post title. Also I would always shrug off the constant times I'd wake up from a nap or go to one of my doors and see it was unlocked. I'm a forgetful person and didn't grow up locking doors. I'll often even be like oh yeah I recall forgetting to lock it when I came home but sometimes I don't recall forgetting to lock it and now I'm thinking that cuz Francis will be opening that crap when he's moving around the house. That's all. Edit. Just to clarify. 
My apartment is half of the second floor of an old house that was built in the 1860s it still has the original frame and actually the front door is the original door. So it's not like an apartment complex it's just an old Victorian style house in a small city in upstate New York. When I was 18, my mother took me to a fortune teller. Three out of seven prophecies of his already came true. Just a little background. I originally come from Ukraine, and I travel a lot all my life. I studied and lived in England from 12 until 21 years old, and now I'm working on Belgium. My mother knew this fortune teller, who was known to be diagnosed diseases just by holding your hand, as well as predict your future, at least key events. My mother was worried about my future since I had so many opportunities, that she took me to see this guy. I had exams coming up, and it was a good way to both distract myself and learn something new. The guy made a total of 7 predictions. I will first mention the ones that happen and then rest that are yet to be. Just to let you know, this guy lives in a tiny village, and never traveled outside of it, nor does he have access to the internet. Anyway, here goes. I would get 82% in my exams. He guessed the exact percent. I was doing well in my studies at all, and I only started studying properly in the last months. He put his hand on my forehead and immediately said I shouldn't worry, as I will get 82% which is what I need to get into a university I wanted. That came true and I went to university. 2. I have problems with my liver. I was a very healthy kid, and did a lot of sports semi-professionally. In my school at 18 years old, I was in a football, rowing and tennis team. I barely drink and eat properly and had a very healthy body composition. After he said I have problems with my liver, we went to a doctor and guess what? I had an enlarged and hardened liver. Doctors had no idea what caused it, and to make it normal I had to do a special diet for 2 months. After that, it all went back to normal. 3. I would travel to Finland for work at 23 years old, but not before then. I had a business trip to Estonia and Finland last December. And guess what? I literally traveled to Finland the day before I turned 24. I had no control over booking the tickets or scheduling this business trip. My management sent me on this mission. I never been to Finland, nor any Nordic countries ever. 4. At 28 I will have 1000 employees under my management. Hasn't happened yet. I am currently trying to work myself up to become a project manager, but still not sure if it's possible for this to happen. Right now I manage around 30 employees, so it's a big jump to 1k, but we will see. 5. In my entire life, I will travel to Russia only twice. Hasn't happened yet. Due to a political climate between Ukraine and Russia, I haven't traveled to Russia ever yet, although I do want to visit badly. 6. I will marry a blonde woman and will have two daughters. Hasn't happened yet. It was always a dream of mine to have daughters, not sons. I can't explain why. Just always wanted to. I have mostly females in my family. Loads of sisters, aunts and grandmas. So let's see. 7. I will move and live in Finland most of my life. Might happen soon. This is quite unbelievable. He said that when he concentrated on my future, he saw the word Suomi around me a lot. At the time none of us knew what it was. He also said that I would live and probably die in Finland. When I came home and googled what Suomi is, it turned out to be a language spoken in Finland. And as for working there, when I had a business trip, I made some connections with other colleagues, who invited me for some potential working position. So I might end up moving there sooner rather than later. So that's that. He predicted a lot of things, like prostate cancer in early stage for my dad's friend, which saved his life, as well as healing my grandma's depression by one 15 minutes talking session. I don't know if there is anything to this guy, but it's sure not just accidents. I believe the ghost of a suicide victim tried to get me to kill myself too. I shared this story in a comment in an Ascredic post then realized it would probably be appreciated here. This is a true story. Trigger warning for suicide. My husband and I moved into an apartment a couple years ago where I started to basically go insane. It always felt like someone was watching me and I became horrifically depressed. I would get so sad that sometimes I would even just spontaneously start crying and I often fantasized about hanging myself from the rafters in this one room. I would sometimes hear the rafters creaking and go in there then imagine myself hanging in front of the window being the cause of the creaking. 
I had been depressed in the past, but this was something on another level. I was seriously suicidal, despite being happily married and genuinely enjoying life before moving into this place. I thought that I had some serious mental illness that was emerging. Several months into living there, our neighbor, a sweet old woman that had lived in the building for decades, told us that a young woman hung herself from the rafters in that room in the late 80s. She was discovered by a man walking his dog who saw her hanging in front of the window. Our neighbor said she was a very unfriendly person, who kept to herself and never had anyone over. According to her, every single one of the female tenants in their mid-twenties to early thirties that have moved in since her suicide never renewed their leases past the first year and all seemed troubled, as she put it. While they lived there, I was 27 at the time, the exact same age she was when she died. My husband and I noped the frick out of there pretty much immediately after we learned this. We still had a few months left on our lease, so we had to pay double rent during that time. But it was worth it. Literally the day we got out my mental health recovered completely and has been back to normal ever since. I believe with all my heart that she was there in that apartment with us. And for whatever reason, she wanted me to repeat history and endure the same fate as her. I saw something on my way home from work that scared me half to death. I've posted in here before. And idk if this story is allowed bc it's not a ghostly experience or haunted house. But I have zero explanation for the event. Before I tell you my story, I'm gonna give you some context about my drive home from work, the state I live in and such. This happened about 10 minutes after I left work today, the 4th of July, 2020. I live in Northeast Ohio, and I got a new job about 2 months ago as a process technician at a dairy plant. I pays very good money, considering it's a 34, 35 mile drive one way. After about 20 or 25 miles, I drive through a wooded area, thin uncommon for me, as where I live in the Ohio, forests are common, and I pretty much lived in the one behind my grandma's house growing up. I work 4pm to 4am, and the drive home sucks, whether it's being tired, hungry or the fog almost every night, I go the same way every day and night, I was driving my way home. I just left the residential area of my workplace and was going through the forested area. As I said, there's almost fog every night, so I'm on high alert for deer, raccoons and such critters. It's just like every other drive home so far. I have a podcast on, focusing on the road, thinking of getting either a sausage McMuffin or McGriddle from McDonald's, and sometimes looking off to the side of the road for any eyes reflecting off my headlights. All of a sudden. I see some reflecting eyes. Out of the woods comes a coyote. In my hometown, coyotes aren't too rare. I've seen them by my high school, but had never seen one outside of my hometown. So it surprised me. I start slowing down as it crosses the road, until it turns to my car and sits in the road. It sat about 10 feet from my car. There had been no cars I had seen since leaving the residential area, so I was going to go around it. But I thought this was too odd of a thing to happen to just drive away from it. I expected it to just get up and walk away at any given second. This is where I began to get very scared. I honked my horn, and after about 2 or 3 seconds, it smiles at me. I have my brights on, so I can see it perfectly. This coyote had human shaped teeth. My heart dropped and every hair on my body raised, just as it is now recalling this incident. It lasted about 1 second before sitting up and running into the woods. I sat there in fear for about 5 seconds, before shoving my foot on the pedal and driving at getaway speed. I didn't stop and get food cause I had, and still have, no appetite. I thought the rest of the ride home what I saw. Once doubting I saw it, but like I said, W my brights on and it as close to my car as it was. I saw it as clear as day. This coyote had human teeth, and there was no doubt about it. I'm very into the paranormal, and that includes cryptids. Is it possible I ran into a skinwalker or some genetically mutated coyote? I am Native American if that counts for anything. It's so weird typing this out, but I'd like someone who knew more about these things to help out if they can. I know one thing though, and that's I'm finding a new way to work. A being saved my life. I will spare you all the gruesome details, but my grandfather was a sadistic. 
Violent predator. Pr to cover up an affair. My dad dropped me there for the weekend mom thought we were camping. Grandfather abused me terribly. I was 8. When I regained consciousness. I screamed at him that I would tell what he had done. That pee him off. So he drugged me outside in the middle of the night. And tied me to one of those old. Metal lawn chairs. It was autumn and it was drizzling outside. I was so cold that night. I'm pretty sure I had hypothermia. I just remember shaking and that the wet and cold hurt. I was going to die I felt it. Then there was a bright. Blue light. Out of it stepped a tall. Thin woman with black hair. Cut straight and straight bangs. She was wearing white and had a bead necklace. She walked over to me and touched my face. Then hugged me. Her skin was so soft and she was so warm. Then she stood behind me. I expected she would untie me and we would go into the light I thought I was dead. Instead, she put her arms around me, and she had colorful wings. I remember being shocked because I thought angel wings were white. I immediately got warm, and dry. My muscles relaxed and the aches and pains from grandfather eased. I can still feel the warmth that I felt. I can still remember her floral smell. I never in my life before or since felt as safe as I did in her arms wings. She stayed until morning. I think grandfather forgot me because he came running out at dawn. He commented that I must have gotten loose because I was dry and everything was still wet out. In high school we were studying Egyptian mythology. I saw a painting of a set, Isis, for the first time and knew it was her that had saved my life. To this day, I have a statue of her in my living room to show thanks for saving me. A friend said goodbye to me in my dream right before I found out he died. A quick backstory. When I was about 12 years old, I met a boy who was only 2 years younger than me. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed with a fatal and incurable disease known as Batten disease. I knew that he needed a friend so I stayed by his side as he faced sudden blindness and paralysis. As often as I could, I would go over and help out around the house, read to him, and watch movies. I remember one night I grew very tired and quickly dozed off. My dream started with me walking to his house as usual, and then I suddenly saw him running towards me with a smile on his face. I was stunned in the dream, looking at him with pure confusion. He came up to me and started talking as I stood there frozen. So this is what you look like. I want you to know that you were my only friend and I don't want you to worry. I'm not in pain anymore. The dream ended with him walking away as I woke up. I laid there processing the dream and an hour or so later, my mom came into my room, crying as she delivered the news. He passed away. Even though it was very sad, the dream made me feel at peace. Does anyone else have a similar experience? Okay, ghosts are real. I am right now sitting in my front porch smoking a cigarette. I cannot bring myself to go back inside my house. There is someone in there. Just over 2 months ago I moved into a new house after losing nearly everything to COVID. I won't go into details or draw this out. Typing this out is making my eyes well and every hair on my body stand straight up. But god damn it I saw a human shaped shadow in my walk-in closet. Am I going crazy? Maybe, but I know that I am not at the same time. Okay, this is what happened. I am laying in my bed browsing reddit, and from the corner of my eye I catch movement coming from my closet. Within literal milliseconds I turn and see someone standing inside of it, looking right at me. You guys. I flipped the frick out, sprung up, ran out of my room, slammed the door, and grabbed a kitchen knife. I yelled and screamed about calling police, that I had a knife, and basically acted like a scared monkey. No response. After about a minute of yelling and realizing I had left my phone in my bedroom, to call 9, 1, 1, I slowly peeked in. There was simply nothing there you guys. Nothing. No one could have gone anywhere. I'm freaking pee and terrified about this. I saw this person. I saw their shape, their movement, their arms. There was a humanoid figure in my closet, and that is all I know. IDK what to do from here. Date number 1. Nothing at all. Back in the house. Update number 2. I took some advice from some of you, and feeling very very silly I spoke loudly and assertively to my empty closet and told the entity to leave. Update number 3. Nothing has happened still, but I found out some really unfun news. Apparently the previous owner of this house committed suicide. I wasn't able to get any more information than that. That does not make me feel any better. I don't know if they were in the house when they did it, 
or if they were male or female, or if it is related at all. My experiences with the Bell Witch Haunting, I lived in Adams, Tennessee growing up from about ages 14 18, 2004 to 2008, a couple of weeks after my family and I moved there something unexpected happened, I was mowing on my dad's tractor, with a big gate featuring wide back end mower, I was going down a hill when my horizon line violently was thrown around as the tractor tires hit something, I disengaged the mower, pulled the tractor around at the base of the hill I had just gone down, my blood went cold as I look up through the swathe I had just cut, like a buzzer going down the middle of someone's head making a lane in the grass, in that lane were four native american burial graves, my parents started reaching out to anyone who might be able to help us identify the graves, anthropologists, historians, accredited people, etc. Those people unanimously agreed that these four graves were from the Trail of Tears. They corroborated this from what I remember because of how the graves were laid, very very shallow, with a giant slab of stone where a gravestone would be. The fact that they were interned on a hillside to keep the water from sinking in and raising the bodies since they had to bury them so quickly, and many other reasons. I consider myself a very logically driven and rationally minded person. Basically I let my empirical senses try to explain something before I'll open myself to other possibilities. Yet, there were things that happened to me and my whole family that we weren't able to rationalize with a scientific mindset or anything logical. Event 1. The activity in our house started shortly after the mowing incident. We heard heavy knocking and pounding on the brick outer wall of the house, encircling the house. No matter where you were in the house you could hear the knocking. Some nights I would hear running footsteps accompanying the pounding. This activity happened nearly every night. As the nights passed I started feeling a heavy presence in my room, a suffocating one, like a heavy weight sitting on my solar plexus constantly. Whatever was happening decided to latch onto me. Event 2. Things continued to escalate. One night I was letting my golden retriever out to go pee. We had a ranch style house overlooking the Red River. The door we were exiting was on the back side of the house facing the river. As I opened the door I start hearing faint whispering something akin to leaves being blown scratching across the ground. I looked up at the trees to see if the wind was blowing. Everything was perfectly still. It was fall in Tennessee, so tons of leaves on the ground. They were not moving either. The scratchy blowing leaf noise continued, but as it continued it grew closer and louder. It sounded like a language of some sort like how do you imagine an incantation or something nefarious in the tone of the sound. I looked down at my golden retriever. All of the hair on her back was standing up and she was snarling like a rabid wolf, yet not barking just kind of frozen in a fear response. I started getting extremely nauseous and could smell sulfur. I was completely frozen when my dog launches herself through the door's threshold and starts gnashing her teeth midair snarling and chomping. The voices were now coming from directly in front of me. I could hear them as if someone was standing there a foot or two away. I grabbed my dog Madeira and pull her quickly inside, slammed the door and threw the deadbolt into place. The door and frame shook violently as a vicious pounding started hammering on the threshold. I ran with my dog to the center of the house, flipping on every light along the way. We sat there alone all night until the sun came up. Ginger. My golden retriever laid across my lap the entire night pressing into me while she whimpered for hours. All I could do was pet her and try to calm her down, which was also helping me downregulate. This was impossible though. The entire night until sunrise, the back door was thumping. Event 3. It happened when I was coming home from football practice. I had all my gear in a gym bag over my left shoulder. This is important, because of how I entered the house. As I closed the front door behind me, I began sitting down the gear bag from my left side which caused me to look right. The room when you first walked in was our library where we had a leather couch, chair, piano, bookshelves, and a wooden rocking chair. There was something sitting in the rocking chair. My peripheral vision caught it first, the chair going back and forth. As my vision centered on the chair there was a humanoid looking shape sitting there. Head glancing downward at the book it was holding. Long black hair drawn down over its head and completely void of light. To picture what I saw. Imagine the silhouette of a person. But rather a void of light. The light coming in around the edges of it seemed to be eaten up by the presence void. As the light spilled over the contour edges of the humanoid shape. Like how black holes are visualized. 
Almost exactly. It felt like I had jumped off a bridge into ice cold water. I blasted myself backwards against the door screaming and fell down. As I was falling I saw the void blur suddenly as it shot across the walls of the house and out through a huge bay window overlooking the river. My golden retriever was in the next room and she sprinted to chase the shadow across the walls, barking and clawing at the walls. After it left through the window my dog came to me and laid on my lap until my parents got home. Event 4. I was fishing with my cousin Jack on the river by our house. We were right on the bend of a river, so the moon would be shining on both sides of the river racing out at two lines like a 90 degree angle from the house. Super beautiful when you weren't on edge. The reason I bring this up, there was a lot of light on the river that evening. Jack was about 10 or so at the time. He reaches up and taps me. Does that lady need help? I looked to where he was pointing and there was a pale woman dressed in white clothes going back and forth picking up stones just to the left of us across the river. I had seen her many times before around the property, and whenever I would get close she would disappear behind a tree or something similar would happen. Knowing this, I told Jack as calmly as I could that it was time for dinner and he needed to go up to my mom immediately, in an attempt to not scare him. When I walked him up and made sure he was on his way I looked back over and she was gone, but I could hear a splashing in the water below. Event 5. Myself, my dad, his friends, and some other family members were staked out along the river bend on the gravel bar beneath the rise to our house. Nothing out of the ordinary at first, it was the 4th of July and we were having an actual good time for a change. We were all spread out about 15 yards from each other. Each man had a low end gas Coleman lantern. As the sun was setting my dad looks over at me like something was bugging him. He told me later he felt like someone had just thrown a bucket of ice water over him before it began. For the sun had just gone down when this happened. In unison all the lanterns were cranked up full blast. Then just as quickly became barely a flame. Then the fires roared to life again. Down to barely a flame. Roared to life. Then they went completely out. Right as the flames went out. We heard the most godforsaken scream by some woman across the river. Whatever it was kept on screaming despite our best attempts to call out to help. As her scream reached a crescendo, it sounded like what I could only imagine a person's throat being cut interrupted her scream. The sound of a dead weight fall of a human body tumbled down the hillside across from us and splashed violently into the water. At this point all the guys had their flashlights out. That's when something started swimming and splashing around in the water on both sides of the river bend. The splashing receded towards the opposite gravel bar, and whatever it was got out and started pacing back and forth across the rocks there. We were pointing all of our flashlights to where the sound was coming from but we couldn't identify where it was originating. It's safe to say we were running up the hill at this point. We all got inside the house, locked the doors. Then gathered in the central living room. Nobody wanted to leave for fear of what was outside. We all stayed up that night because the wall pounding was more violent than it had ever been. Bam. 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 All night like the ticking of some demonic clock. I didn't sleep for two days after this event. Event 6. Lost time. I was walking through the woods near the Bellwitch Cave. One moment it was completely sunny and blue skies about mid-afternoon. The next moment it was overcast and looked like maybe 4pm. Event 7. Night terrors. Torture dreams. Being held down and brutally drawn and quartered. Dreams of walking through the house and the void person placing their hand on my chest and pushing through my solar plexus. Body violently shaking in the dream like a having a seizure. Event 8. Visited the Bell House plantation marker in a tobacco field adjacent to my family's property. Brought friends to try and prove that something crazy was happening to my family. The rite of passage in the area is to go to the stone marker where the paranormal events happened hundreds of years ago. Then dance on the stone saying I don't believe in the bell which I got them to promise that they wouldn't do that while we went. Of course the moment we get there, one guy who doubted the legends in a massive way, jumps up onto the stone marker and starts screaming I don't believe in the bell which as loud as he could. I get so upset at him. I'm the only one that knows the way back, so I said come on guys we're leaving. In this area it's known as the Tennessee River Valley, so there's tons of flowing water etc around these tobacco fields. The reason this is important is because of what happened next. We're making good time walking back across this crop field, hundreds of yards long, 
A mist starts rolling and from the river bends and begins to saturate the field. The temperature drops easily 25 degrees or so and we start seeing our breath. I begin to smell sulfur in the breeze. As the mist became a fog it began. I started hearing this wheezy and deeply cavernous sounding breath around us. Like being inside a cave that was breathing. Out of nowhere we started hearing these giant blasting sounds and I realized something was walking on the chopped tobacco stalks. Side note, when they harvest tobacco they use a machete and cut down at a 45 degree angle leaving about 3.5 feet of brittle stalk poking out of the ground. When you step on said stalks, they disintegrate in a very loud way as they burst apart. This starts happening all around us like an army of native spirits running around as if we were in a bandwagon battle. The blasts were coming from every single direction in the fog. That's when I hear it. That deep cavernous noise turns into this giant sniffing sound. Like some Lovecraftian beast smelling its prey just out of eyesight. At this point I yell run in pure panic mode. We take off across the field trying not to trip and be skewered on the stalks. They dry out and get really sharp where they harvest them. Also Robertson County is the world's largest producer of tobacco per square mile. So these fields are everywhere. Fun fact. As we are exiting the field and our feet hit the gravel road, the lower center part of my back suddenly explodes in agony. I look down and there's a massive rock laying at my feet and I realize that I had just been assaulted. By the time I got to my house and examined my back in a mirror, the bruise was about the size of a basketball and was already turning black. Event 8. Woke up outside about 3 in the morning. I was laying next to the four graves on the property. The night was awfully cold but I woke up soaked in sweat. We lived there for so long that I have many events to share, process, and willing to have discussions about my time there with you all. It is really hard for me to talk about this stuff without re-traumatizing myself, but my friends and family are encouraging me to share my experiences with like-minded people so I can try to find peace surrounding my trauma. Thank you for reading. My dad saved my graduation after his death. So, my dad died almost 7 years ago, when I was 15, and this happened already 3 years later. I was close to graduation, and especially my final exam in physics gave me a hard time, because I really couldn't get to grips with relativity and that shenanigans. Anyway, one morning, I was really tired, haven't slept well, or at all I should say, and I was about to fall asleep in the last row in my classroom, when... Just as I was beginning to close my eyes, I heard my dad's voice, clear as day, say hey, blank, wake up and listen. It was so clearly his voice, the tone, the melody, when he was calling my name in a happy manner. He was almost kinda singing, it was him. I was baffled for a moment, but when rebooted after that moment of shock, it was exactly the moment when our teacher dropped a very important hint to what the final exam's theme will be. I would have totally slept through that, hadn't my dad woken me up. What's important about this is that with the teacher's hint, I realized that I was learning the wrong stuff and would totally have failed the final. Bonus. Less paranormal, but a beautiful end to the story. That same night I had a dream. Me and my dad sat on our porch, chatting, laughing, and, which I remember very distinctly, we were drinking his favorite beer together. So when I was drinking the last drops, the sun was setting. I looked to the chair next to me and my dad was gone. I just once again heard him say hey, wake up, and that's the exact moment when my alarm clock began ringing. Thank you to everyone who read this completely. It's a story I kept for myself for 4 years. Unless they wanted you to light the candle for them, like the offerings. Heard a gunshot in my dream. Woke up to my mom telling me my aunt shot herself. This happened a few years back and I never told my mother or my father since it was a sensitive subject. Had a dream my friend Dylan and I were in a two story home. He was showing me his new guitar. We're having a good time, joking around, when we hear a gunshot downstairs. We look at each other and book it down the stairs. When I hit the bottom step, I wake up to my mom on my bed in tears. She tells me my aunt who lived on the other side of the country, has committed suicide. When I ask what happened, she told me she shot herself. We weren't ever close as she lived 1500 miles away from me. My father had a rough childhood. She was his half sister and a bit older than he was. I never met her in person. It was just such an odd moment. Like I said, I've never told anyone. 
just my current husband and my best friend at the time. I never knew what to make of it. The hospital medium. In 2002, my youngest brother unfortunately passed away from cancer at the age of 5. When he was alive, he would always request pennies from people family, friends, doctors, etc. At the time of his passing he had collected a water cooler jug full of pennies, and we buried him with a huge bag of them. Over the years we have randomly found pennies on family outings, whenever we are feeling down, etc and have always taken it as a sign of him saying hello. My dad was always skeptical of this, and has always had a hard time with his passing. One day, my dad was in the waiting room at the hospital to see his doctor when he saw this old lady. She had a walker and was mumbling to herself. She kept swatting at the air and shaking her head. Finally, she approached my dad and said I normally don't do this, but he won't leave me alone. Did you lose a young son? My dad shook his head yes. He wants to know if you are getting the pennies, does that mean anything to you? He wants you to know he is okay, and that they are from him. My said thank you and she walked away. A few moments later after my dad fully realized what happened, he got up to find her to ask her more questions, but he couldn't find her, and he has yet to see her again. No one other than our family knew about the pennies, certainly not some random lady at the hospital. Now when we find pennies, my dad knows my brother is okay, and will happily pick them up and put them in his pocket. My son reacted to a thought that came across my mind while he was sleeping. My 3 years old son was sleeping next to me in my bed last night. Let me ask you something. Does anybody else, when really tired and just as you start to try and go to sleep, get a random word or phrase thrown into your head automatically by a random voice that's louder than your usual thoughts? This usually seems to happen to me as I start to try and sleep. The words or quick phrases never really make sense, and I don't ever feel a presence near me or anything. It's literally just someone else's voice yelling into my mind really quick. Just seems like some weird glitch while my mind is starting to go into sleep mode or something. Doesn't feel paranormal at all. Well, last night the phrase was by a woman's voice saying enjoy happiness and right after it was said in my head, my son sleep talking said i enjoy like as if he was agreeing with the statement it's just too bizarre to be a coincidence it's like we had the same thought at the same exact time i swear there's so much more to this life than we know my aunt's experience in a nursing home my aunt used to work in a nursing home there was an old woman who lived there universally beloved by all the staff who often talked about how much she wished she were young again and could wear high heels Every single photo of her in her room, she was wearing high heels. This woman loved shoes. One night, my aunt was talking to another nurse, when they suddenly heard the distinct loud sound of someone walking through the corridor wearing high heels. The sound moved away from them and faded away. Both my aunt and her colleague instinctively knew what had happened. They checked on the old woman, and she had died in her sleep. It's nice to know that she could finally wear her favorite shoes again on her way to wherever she was going. US Army in Iraq. Jing Ghost Encounters. I was asked to share this, so here you go. Post your Jin stories, veterans. I was an infantryman during the invasion of Iraq in 2003. My unit was 1 stroke 22 in 4th aid. We pushed into Baghdad, and then took an airfield just north of the city. Then we headed north, up Highway 1. The majority of my unit stayed in Tikrit, Saddam's hometown. My company kept going north with 3 stroke 66 armor to a huge enemy ammo depot near Beji. We began operating around that area, and then shortly moved to nearby K2 airfield, and set up a more permanent free on board. K2 airfield had a residential area that had been abandoned, near the end of the runway. It was on post housing for the Iraqi Air Force personnel that ran the base, but they had left way before our arrival. What was strange is that it seems it was abandoned before the invasion. There were pots and pans in the sink, there were clothes on the line, but there was lots of dust all over everything. Looters had been there, they were everywhere during that time, but they left mostly everything. My unit moved into the end of the airfield, into some bombed out warehouses, and an MP company moved into the biggest houses in the abandoned housing area. We started to call the ghost town. The MPs that took up residence in the ghost town moved out after about a week. 
I asked one of the very tired looking MPs why, as everyone was jealous that they lived in actual homes, albeit abandoned, shabby ones, instead of bombed out warehouses, and I was curious about their speedy move. He said that they couldn't sleep, doors would open and shut all night, they heard footsteps running up and down the halls at night, and then finally they began to see children's faces looking in at them through the windows. The US Army does not function with consideration to ghosts, and for them to get their chain of command to move their whole company out of the ghost town, there must have been some tangible events that affected their operational readiness. Their move meant that now our residence was the new perimeter of our free on board closest to the ghost town, so we took up nighttime security every night around our warehouse. We would each do an hour shift, and we had a watch going all night long. We had thermal sights, and night vision, and we would sit out there scanning the desert for enemy activity. During our watch, we could all hear children laughing and playing, all night long. It sounded like a playground was active in the ghost town. But we verified with our thermal sights, it was empty. We often had pebbles thrown at us. We would sit out there, alone or in pairs, and listen to the laughter while getting hit by rocks. Nothing big, but they would bounce off your face, your helmet, your vest, the whole time scanning with thermals and night vision. Nobody there, listening to the laughter. This happened night after night, we all talked about it with each other, nobody was happy about it, but we sucked it up. In 2004, we had a change of command, and upon hearing about the situation, our new commanding officer said there is no supernatural activity in this ghost town, only enemy activity. This was partially true because we had been attacked with sniper fire and RPGs from that direction multiple times. His decision was to set up a nightly patrol and set up ambushes in the ghost town. Every night, we were already busy, looking for WMDs during the day, raiding Sodom's Bathists during the night. We had been doing 1836 hour patrols, QRF, convoy security, more patrols, show of force, ambushes, the works, and now this. So it began. My squad had done the new patrol a few times, and it always seemed extra dark when walking through the ghost town. There was an old British fort left over from their colonial days, with firing ports and towers, streets with sidewalks, and pretty decent houses, all empty. While on patrol, we could still hear the kids playing, but it seemed just as faint as when we were on perimeter guard. We would get on a roof, lay there on ambush and just listen, to the wind, the kids, and that's it. One night, we were patrolling through the ghost town, in a modified wedge formation. One of our soldiers said what the frick then screamed what the frick is that he pointed his weapon to the middle of our formation, then dropped his weapon, and ran. He ran alone in the dark, unarmed in the middle of a combat zone, away from everyone. Those of us that looked where he pointed, saw it. Those of us that looked at the fleeing soldier, heard it. Walking with us was a solid shadow, with roughly the shape of a person, tall, with really long arms, skinny legs and a very narrow torso. It turned its head back and forth as if surprised to be discovered. It bent down, and then it leaped. It landed in a crouch on top of a nearby chain link fence still facing us, and moving its head to look at us. Its eyes then quickly flashed red, and then it jumped backwards off the fence and disappeared into the night. We caught up with the soldier. Our squad leader was super P. He got roughed up a bit, as he had absolutely lost it, screaming and crying. This soldier was solid. I've personally seen him shoot an enemy, at close range. We'd all been through a lot, and we were both confident and competent. What we saw that night was not the scariest thing we had been through that deployment. Engaging the enemy on the regular was. But the enemy made sense. This creature didn't it was by far the most disturbing thing I've ever witnessed, as it seemed to have a purpose keeping pace with us. From that point on, Whenever it was our turn to patrol ghost town, our squad leader would lead us to just the edge and we would wait in ambush. I'm sure we all still appreciate that to this day. I just received a handwritten letter that is unexplainable. I honestly don't know how to explain the strange handwritten letter I received last week. For backstory, my family and I have been staying with my parents for 3 months because I've had some health problems. 
We didn't tell a lot of people because we were still in the same town and everyone was sheltering in place anyway. Last Monday my mom told me I had received a letter in the mail and I could tell by her voice she was intrigued. It was strange that I was getting mail at her address as they had only lived there about 2 years and it had never been my permanent home. I head downstairs and she hands me a written letter addressed to me but using my maiden name. I've been married over 10 years and my name is now distinctly different. The return address is in town from Patty C. Names change obviously. I don't know anyone by that name. To reiterate, my parents didn't own this home when I went by my maiden name. So we're obviously very interested to see the contents of this envelope. I open it and unfold a handwritten note on 9.5x11 ruled notebook paper. The letter is very personal so I won't type it out but it goes into detail about my health struggles and how this Patty C person cares deeply for me and is praying for me to get better. She wrote like we are best friends. At the bottom she signed her name with a PS. To call her anytime. My mom and I are so incredibly confused and concerned about who this person is so I decide to call the number. A woman picks up and I ask for Patty C. The woman pauses and then sighs and explains that her mother, Patty C, died a year and half ago. I apologize and am about to hang up, more bewildered than ever, when this woman, let's call her Kim, ask why I am calling for her mother on her, Kim's, cell phone. I'm not sure what to say and stumble through an explanation that I received a letter from her mother and it listed this number. Kim is silent for a while. Then she says she's only had this cell number for 6 months, well after her mother's death. I apologize again and say there must be some mistake and hang up. My mom and I decided to google the address. It's a small public park in town. I'm so confused. Paranormal occurrence maybe? Extremely strange glitch? Extraordinary coincidence? Who knows? This is going to bother me for the rest of my life. My friend said goodbye the night he died. This happened in 2012 and has haunted me filled me with love ever since. I woke up one Saturday morning and remember dreaming about a friend Dan apologizing that we'd not spoken in a couple of months and saying goodbye. It made me smile because I missed him and it was really nice to see him, even in a dream. I got up, went to meet my sister for breakfast and while walking down the road I was logging onto FB to send Dan a message about the dream and just say hi. I wouldn't normally be on FB this early but wanted to send the message while the dream was still fresh and happy. A mutual friend of ours had put up a status telling everyone that Dan had had an accident and died during the night. I was, and still am 8 years later, absolutely devastated. He was one of my favorite people who could make me smile without even trying. But I feel so comforted knowing that as he died he came and said goodbye. I've told only a few people about this because it means so much to me, but I'm not really sure anyone has truly believed or understood the significance of it. Anyway, this is my story, I just thought I'd share, smiling face. I have never experienced genuine terror until last night. I want to start off by saying I have never experienced anything visual like this before. If there is a possible explanation I would like to hear it. My girlfriend and I are in the process of moving into a basement suite. We still technically reside at our old place across town for another 3 days. Her name is the only one on the lease since we've been having some relationship issues due to work stress and personal problems. This basement suite we moved into had been completely gutted and most of the appliances and flooring replaced, except for the bathroom. It's now a city legal suite with its own water heater etc since they had been a massive police investigation done a few months prior. We weren't told much about what happened here other than drug related incidents. I went into the bathroom to do some cleaning yesterday evening and noticed what looks like blood at the bottom of the radiator. I've attached a photo at the bottom of the post. It seemed creepy and I didn't want to touch it just yet because gross. Anyways, a few hours pass and my girlfriend goes to bed in the bedroom and I fall asleep on the couch watching TV. I woke up around 4am to our cat knocking a plant off the windowsill and fricking with the blinds. The lights were off but I have a big black light aquarium in the living room which lit up most of the living room kitchen area. My girlfriend came out of the room to ask what was going on and I was all pee off, half asleep cleaning dirt off the countertops. She told me to leave it for tomorrow and to just come to bed and then walked away. I stayed up and continued cleaning for maybe 20 minutes since there was dirt all over the place. This is what freaking terrifies me even thinking about it now. I was in the kitchen wiping down the counters. 
It was pretty dim but I could still see. It's now around 4.30 am. I turned around towards the garbage can and my girlfriend is standing in the dark doorway just staring at me. I couldn't see her face clearly but it was a 6 foot thin figure. The exact build as my girlfriend. I said sorry if I'm keeping you up. I'm almost done. She just stood there facing me. I figured she was just pee off since we had been arguing off and on this whole week. I finished what I was doing and walked past her and asked if she was coming to bed. She didn't move. I walked straight into the bedroom and closed the door and my girlfriend was laying there sleeping. I woke her up by closing the door and I guess the look on my face scared her enough to make her spring up in bed. Wide awake and ask what happened repeatedly. I started gagging, swearing and pretty much just lost it for a minute or two. I told her I just saw her in the kitchen and she said well yeah. I came out earlier and asked what happened. I told her no. I just walked past her into the bedroom. She pretty much just went silent. Peeked out of the door and nothing was there. We both went to sleep a while later. I don't get strange feelings here at all which is the weird part. But holy frick. I have no idea what that was last night and it scared me so bad I almost threw up when I realized my girlfriend had been sleeping that past half an hour. I have no idea what to make of that. TLDR. My girlfriend and I just moved into a new place that has a pretty confidential criminal history. I found what looks like dried blood on the floor in the bathroom and I saw what looked exactly like my girlfriend standing in the doorway when she was really fast asleep in bed. I just spent an hour trying to find out more about this new place my girlfriend and I are living in and it was pretty difficult. I found the old realty listing of the basement suite and both property history and public facts were blank which is odd considering most major police investigations drug busts condemnations are made public, especially in our small city. Nothing came up on our news site either but after just googling the address, about 9 search results down on the Canadian Yellow Pages site there was a guy's first name, initials MDG, with his name, number and our address. I searched his name in our city's obituary site and sure enough he was dead and only 28 euro. He died just a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if he was the last to live down here or not but somebody did die in this place not too long ago. I witnessed something with a few friends in the woods 9 years ago that haunts me till this day. Me and some of my buddies used to go to this place called Profile Rock in Freetown, Massachusetts, late at night sometimes 2-3 in the morning. One night during the summer I go to Profile Rock with three of my friends at 2.30 am just to mess about and explore. Now I didn't know this at the time but Profile Rock and the area we were in is part of an area called the Bridgewater Triangle which is a site of alleged paranormal activities and also one of the most haunted areas in the state I live in. Continuing on we climbed Profile Rock itself stayed on top of it for maybe 3-4 hours. And we all decided to leave. Now as you're leaving Profile Rock you have to go down this long path that's about 2 miles long to get back to where we parked our car. Two of my friends are walking about 20-30 feet in front of me and my other friend. Now I'll never know why I turned around. I didn't have a feeling like someone was watching us. I just simply turned around because besides the moonlight shining through the trees in certain areas we only had cell phone flashlights to make our way around. I remember turning around and seeing someone running at us from about 150 feet away full speed. What threw me off wasn't that they were running at us. It was how they were running. You know how a zombie walks in a horror movie dragging one of its legs almost limping. That's how this someone was running at us. At first I didn't say anything and possibly assumed it was one of my friends or someone that was already in there who got injured and needed assistance. Until this someone made it to an area of the path where the moonlight reached through the trees and gave them some perspective. What I saw still chokes me up till this day. You ever see a child try to draw a person how they make a stick figure most of the time? That's exactly how this someone looked. I caught maybe a 10 second glance as it was running under the moonlight lit trees but I saw no distinguishable facial features, no eyes, no mouth and no ears. Its arms and legs looked like that of an extremely malnourished person only completely black and it didn't look like skin or any 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 I recall calling out to my friend in a panicked voice who was walking with me, who was now maybe 10 feet ahead of myself. I shined my cell phone light on him as he was looking where I was just looking and I could tell right away from his facial expression that I wasn't seeing things. 
It was now maybe 40 feet away from us if that almost the same distance as our friends in front of us and me and my friend just took flight and started running. My two other friends in front of shot around and asked us what was wrong and I replied just run and all four of us jetted for our car. I remember taking a glance back as we were running and there was nothing there even though whatever was chasing us would certainly be on our tails by now. We all hopped in the car, and my friend who was walking with me yells dude tell Emmy you seen that? What the frick was that I told him I seen the same thing I asked him to describe to all of us what he saw and he described literally the exact same thing I witnessed. By now my other two friends are thinking we were joking around or messing with them. Until my friend who was walking with me swore on his father who has passed away not even a month ago that he's telling the truth. I was kind of frustrated tbh. Because I couldn't believe my other two friends didn't see it as they turned around to question why we were running but it doesn't matter now. We actually went back there with a few more people the day after and witnessed nothing of course. I'll never know what it was or who it was or what it wanted. But I know one thing there's no way in heck two people both imagined seeing some stick figure specter in the woods. TL. DR. Me and my friend witnessed a stick figure looking figure chasing us in one of the most haunted areas in my state. I am still processing this. I drive for Uber and I stopped at this house a few hours ago. As I'm waiting, a light turned on upstairs and this little boy was turning the lights on, waving at me, then turning them off. He did it a few times and was smiling and looked like he may be laughing. I waved back and smiled and even though it was late, I didn't even question it. The girl got in my car a few minutes later. I thought she took so long because the kid was hers and I commented how cute the kid upstairs was and her face went pale. She looked me straight in the eye and told me no one lives upstairs. I laughed because it's spoopy season and I thought she was messing with me. I stopped shortly after I looking in the rear view mirror and saw that she was starting to cry. She took a few deep breaths and asked me what I saw. So, I told her about the little boy turning on the lights. She called her boyfriend who was still there and was full on freaking out. Turns out her boyfriend had several people mention the kid that plays with the lights and waves. I would have thought it was a joke, but she was shaking and almost had a panic attack about this. Her boyfriend was woken up by the call and the entire downstairs was dark when I picked her up. I have no other explanation for this because of her reaction. My hair is still standing on end thinking about it. For those worried about the child and suspect foul play, I did place a call to the local police and they did confirm that there is no child at the residence, although they wouldn't tell me if the upstairs apartment was occupied or vacant. I am driving a game tonight so I will try to stop by on a break and see if it happens again. If it does, I will have my camcorder to try and capture anything out of the ordinary. I could not hear anything but he did seem like a little kid that was having fun and being goofy rather than being in any distress. I have been around enough kids to tell the difference as I used to work in a daycare. Thanks again for your enthusiasm. This isn't my first encounter like this and I'm trying to capture more and more. I hope to share more in the future. Update so I went back to the house. I sat there for a bit and nothing happened. With the moon being so bright, it was really cloudy yesterday. I could sort of see into the window where I saw him. The lady wasn't kidding. There is nothing up there. No photos or furniture that could be seen. The app's on the second floor but it is has those long windows that almost reach the floor. Anyway, there was no movement inside. However, as I started to drive away I saw a kid in the yard running. But there was no noise to it, no crunching leaves or anything. I had my window open, radio off. I would be able to hear footfalls or at the very least the shuffling of leaves. It was just a glimpse and I waited for something else but there was nothing. I think it is safe to say that there is something on that property. I have to look into the history of the property. It is a really rough part of the city and many many people die in that area yearly. But I am still curious that turns up. My friend seems to be gone off the face of the planet. So I am currently 21 years old. And up until recently I had not experienced anything that I would call supernatural. I'm still not sure what to think of the supernatural paranormal, but this really freaked me out. I don't know if something brought it on, but I was out with my friends when I suddenly started thinking about the past, particularly about my childhood friend, Brendan. We went to elementary and middle school together, and when I was remembering this, I just assumed that he went to a different high school than me and we drifted apart. 
So I decide that I'm going to track him down and reconnect with him, right? But I can't find any of his social medias, or information about him online. And then I sort of forgot about it for a while. Then about a month ago, I was out with another one of my friends. We'll call her Ama whom I'd known since elementary school as well. And I ask her if she's been in contact with Brendan or if she know how to get to hold of him. She seems to hesitate, but when I mentioned his last name she remembered. She told me she hadn't spoken to him in probably 8 years, but remembered his parents address. So I drive over there, seeing as it's not actually that far away. Then his parents open the door, and I recognize them. So they say hi to me, and invite me inside. I introduce myself and they remark on how much I've grown, and then they say that they don't have a son. I immediately assumed that maybe he had gotten into drugs or something, and they disowned him. But no, they insist that they do not have a son at all, just two daughters, whom I vaguely recognize remember, but there's no doubt that this is his family. I ended up outright accusing them of lying and they got really defensive. So I just apologized and went home. I don't think I got the wrong house. I recognized them and they recognized me. But regardless, I phoned Amy and told her what happened, and asked her if she was sure this was their address. I stopped thinking about it for a little while, until about two weeks ago Amy texted me saying that he wasn't in any of her ebooks. And sure as crap, I check mine and he's not there. We met up a few days ago and we both went in separate rooms to draw what we thought Brendan looked like, just in case he was a shared hallucination. But no, we both came back with drawings that looked almost the same, down to the way he parted his hair, and the location of his three face moles. So in the last few days we've both been going down a rabbit hole of talking to old teachers, friends, etc, and I swear to god it's like he never existed. We even went down to our old middle school to see if he was in any of the class photos, and nothing. I also got some old birthday photos from my mom, and on most of those birthdays I am 100% certain Brendan was there. But again, nothing. Not even my parents remember him. Me and Amp. Amp, Amp, Amy want to check hospital records for some kind of birth certificate or anything, but it's really starting to scare both of us. Is there some kind of explanation for this? Supernatural or otherwise? If it were just me I'd think I dreamed him up. But Ama pointed out the correct address, and we both came up with near identical drawings of him. Update 1. I will keep on updating this post with more information as we look. Me and Amp. 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 Amy are planning to go back to his house tomorrow so we can ask more questions, and show them the composite sketches me and Amy did. We'll be exploring the possibility that Brendan was a foster kid, and we want to take a look at his bedroom. Also, I've become aware that birth certificates are public record, so I'll be looking for a birth certificate tomorrow. At this point I don't know whether he's a missing person, or if he never existed at all. Should I possibly talk to the police? I'm not sure. Update 2. A lot of people are theorizing that Brendan is trans, and that's why his parents insisted they had two daughters, but I don't think that's the case. Brendan had two sisters, so if he transitioned then his parents would have said they had three daughters. Someone also suggested that me and Amp, 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 Amy draw a map of where his room is in the house, so that when we go there we can test a game to make sure this isn't a shared hallucination or something. Amy doesn't remember the exact layout of his house, but claims to remember A, the side of his room where his closet was, and B, what side the window was, so we'll be comparing that instead. Also, on the topic of going back to his house, his parents do like me, they remember who I am, but according to them I was a friendly neighborhood kid who would babysit for them, not Brendan's friend. Which is strange, because I don't think I've ever babysat at all. So I don't think they would be offended to see me again, despite how our last interaction went. Some people also don't believe that we both remembered his moles, but trust me, they're very big, and distinct. Also, some people are talking about similar stories they've seen, please link them. Also, if something like this has happened to you, message me. Update 3. So we went back to visit Brendan's parents, and we told them that we've been looking for Brendan and what we remember. I'm pretty sure they thought we were crazy, but they did cooperate. We also showed them the sketches we did, asked them if they had ever fostered kids, or whatever. Nothing. They agreed to let me tour the house, but not Amy. I guess because they didn't know her, 
And first of all, Amy and I were right about the location of A, his bedroom window, and B, his closet. According to his parents, it's just a sore bedroom though. There isn't a single photo of him in the house, either. I don't think his parents are lying. They honestly don't seem to think they have a son. I also asked them more about our relationship, how I knew them and how they knew me, but they didn't really give any new information. I babysat, helped out around the house, etc. And that was it. Because of corona, we won't be going to the hospitals near us for the time being. But birth certificates are public record, so maybe there'll be some other way to check. We've already contacted old teachers, classmates, etc. And they don't know anything about Brendan. I'm sorry I don't have any answers. A lot of you are proposing theories of alternate timelines and whatnot. And as much of a skeptic as I am, I'm starting to believe that this may be some kind of case of timeline jumping. I've sent my mom the drawings that we did, and I will update this when she responds back to them. Also, some people are understandably skeptical that me and Amy can both draw, but we both attend art classes together so we know how to render a human face. Also, Amy is indeed real. I've seen her have conversations with other people, and people know who I'm talking about when I talk about Amy. Unless everyone I know is fake, which is not the case, then Amy is 100% real. Update 4. So I'm pretty well at a dead end and I think it may be time to give up. A lot of you have put forth the alternate timeline theory, and I'm sort of leaning on that as the answer, but there's no real way to know. I apologize that this story doesn't really have a conclusion. But I guess that's how it is. My mom did reply back to me. I've been texting her for the last hour and a half. She has no idea who the person me and Amy drew is. And I also brought up to her my supposed babysitting for Brendan's parents. And she says she remembers me occasionally doing that. I do not remember this. I work overnight at a museum. I believe in ghosts now. A list of experiences. Short background. I recently landed a sweet overnight security guard job at a museum. A museum I loved as a kid. A well paying, and a awesome camera watching job. It's a modern building, with big windows and modern steel and glass architecture. Not an eerie mansion with spooky stuff hiding around every corner. During orientation, both and and the other trainee asked about ghosts. We both wondered if our doubt about the paranormal would be disproven after working here. Our bosses downplayed it to us. They work in the day, and we're just some college kids they probably want focused on their work, not spooked out. But the other night shift guy, who is quite experienced, told us about a few unexplained things namely, odd smells suddenly developing out of nowhere and disappearing, weird vibes around our older and more morbid artifacts, a KKK outfit, two African American male and female disembodied voices having a conversation hovering in the lobby area, build up, and so I went to work. I quickly got the hang of the job, and I enjoyed it, and still enjoy it. But soon, I began to encounter odd things I couldn't explain. Keep in mind I still didn't believe in the paranormal at the point. Here are my unexplained experiences in the order in which I experienced them. These experiences seem in retrospect to be escalating and building on each other, as I failed to acknowledge the ghosts. You just feel multiple presences on the second floor where most of our artifacts are. Specifically around a KKK outfit, which is behind an exhibit on the black troops in the Civil War. When you walk around there at night, it can sometimes almost feel like walking past several people. Soon the presences became physical. They constantly knocked on metal right next to me. I still didn't believe in ghosts at this point, and tried to debunk it. I couldn't. There is still constant unexplained noises when you walk by. Some of it likely mechanical. Others quite distinctly odd. One time I heard someone tap the exhibit glass. Tried to debunk this as well. And I couldn't. Big experiences. The 18th of October 2020. On the same night I heard the glass tapping. The odd noises and things came to a head. I decided to go out on the third floor lobby where the experienced guard told me he heard voices. I asked is anyone here multiple times and heard nothing. Before leaving. I loudly said I'm about to leave, last chance, if you're here can you make yourself known. Just then I heard a three separate knocks that caught my attention. The final third knock made me look towards the direction of the second floor KKK, which I was unable to see. I distinctly heard a man voice echoing from the KKK area, 
saying something with an upward inflection. I stood there, trying to make sense of what I heard, but it was clear. No one was in the building except me. After this I believed in ghosts. This actually happened tonight, the 11th of August 2020. I heard a someone talking outside the security office three times. The first time, I thought my mind was playing tricks on me. The second time, it sounded like a woman again muffled, but it sounded like she said the word talking. The third time was muffled again outside my door, but it sounded like some again. Also no one else was in the building expect me again. Conclusion. I spoke to the experienced guard again about this. He admitted to me that he had downplayed much of the paranormal stuff, and told me the museum was teeming with ghosts. Here's what I learned. The two African American voices are just in the grand lobby. They also talk next to the security office, where I recently heard the woman. The senior guard also heard the man on the second floor about 5 times. He had not told us about this spirit before I heard it. He also believes there is a demon, or something malicious in the taxidermy storage vault. I have been in there, and definitely felt a pressure, like a pressure to get out of there, but that may be my mind playing tricks on me. He also thinks they might not be attached to any of the objects, but just might be here. I know a 100 year old school for minorities, and later disabled kids, was quite violently demolished to build the museum, and the school's front exterior was rebuilt in the interior of the museum. However, that is the extent of my historical knowledge of the building. The ghosts do not seem malevolent or physical. They do not interact directly with you, or hurt you. Personally, I believe that these ghost spirits just seem to be hanging out here, and that most of what they do is to get you to notice them. Have done the I'm not here to help or hurt you, I'm just here to keep things safe and protected speech, and which subsided much of the activity. I think this is because I acknowledged them. TL. DR. Spooky Museum, read the build up and big experiences bullet points for talking ghosts. My friend and I were rescued by entities in the Texas panhandle. My friend and I were rescued from the ditch during a snowstorm by little phantom people. While returning to New Mexico from a visit to my friend's family in Iowa we were caught in a snowstorm on the Texas panhandle. We were on highway 60 right outside of a town called Canadian when we went off the road in his little Honda car. We tried digging it out and using the floor mats for traction but to no avail. We could see what appeared to be the lights of a farmhouse nearby and although it was 2am, we elected to knock on the door and see if we could get help instead of freezing to death in a rare Texas blizzard out in the middle of nowhere. A tiny old woman answered the door, and I mean tiny, 4 foot something and ancient to boot. We explained that we were stuck and needed a pull out of the ditch and how far to the next town etc. A tiny, maybe 5 foot something. Ancient husband came out and said he'd pull us out with Zuzu and to follow him to the barn. Out in the barn was an old Ford Highboy with a CB radio and a .357 revolver in the front seat pocket. We all climbed in the cab. He rubbed the dash and said come on Zuzu and proceeded to take us to where we had gone off road and yanked the little car out with no problem. We made it to Canadian and stayed in the nastiest roach motel I had ever been in, and slept on top of the covers with all my clothes on. The next day we drove back to New Mexico with no other incidents. Since I was on HWY60 pretty regularly I figured I'd stop in during the day and drop off a gift and say thanks next time I was in the area. The problem is that right outside of Canadian TX on HWY60 near that curve, there is no house, no little old people, no barn, no Zuzu either. I've driven by there a dozen times since we went off the road that night in December and I've pulled up the area on Google Maps and there is just no trace of them. My buddy and I just concluded that guardian angels got us unstuck from the snow and vanished. My whole city reported feeling odd things two nights ago. English is not my native language. You know that feeling you get when you see a big spider in your house and then you look away for a minute and when you look back it's just not there anymore? Well. Me and hundreds of people in the city I live felt that creepy sensation. Simultaneously, two nights ago, I've always been skeptical. I'm always the first one to laugh at this kind of paranormal stuff. But this I believe is the only thing I can't find an explanation for. January the 5th, 2021. Two days ago at the time I'm writing this, was an absolutely normal day. Virtual classes, zooming friends and some video games. Just your average day. However, 
When nighttime came, specifically around midnight, I started feeling this really tense atmosphere in my bedroom. It's not like I actually saw something or heard anything in particular, but it just felt like there was something or someone there, with me, hiding. It got to the point where I had to get up from bed constantly to turn on the lights and check the floor because it felt like there was a rat or a spider creeping around somewhere. I wouldn't say it was terrifying, but it definitely felt cold or heavy atmospheric. Just to make it clear, it's not like I watched a horror movie or played a horror video game before going to bed. Like I said, it was a completely normal daily routine day. When I finally fell asleep, I dreamt of a lot of things, and all my dreams were set in my own house. None of them were nightmares though. Next morning went normal and I had almost forgotten how weird last night was. But then when I was having lunch with my sister, she mentioned she was really tired because she didn't get almost any sleep, and felt like there was a snake in her bedroom. When my mom heard about it, she told us that our dog, who sleeps on her bedroom, was anxious all night, and not only us, but a lot of me sister's friends on Facebook were sharing their experiences that they couldn't sleep well, their dogs were barking all night, heard women screaming, and overall just felt this really tense atmosphere in that someone was watching them, it almost became a meme, even a local news anchor mentioned it on his social media, I'm not necessarily saying this was a paranormal event, but it was definitely weird and I can't find an explanation for it. I tried to do some research on Google but couldn't find anything. In case someone is curious about this, the place I live in is Cuenca, a small city in the highlands of southern Ecuador. Truly the most terrifying experience I've ever had. So one night my wife, son, and I went to stay over at my wife's parents' house. It had gotten dark and my son, about two at the time, got sleepy so I decided to put him to bed. Let me try to explain the room to you. Relevant for later. The door opens on the right side of the room. Immediately to your left is the light switch and the queen size bed is just beside that. It's a small room. Just big enough for the bed and enough room to walk around the bed. The wall in front of the bed is a window. To the left of the bed is a closet with those weird accordion doors. I'm laying in bed with the lights out with my son who is laying his head on my arm. He finally falls asleep, and I just lie there for a few minutes to make sure he is completely out. Then out of nowhere I get this horrible feeling. Goosebumps. Hair standing up on my neck and arms. It was such an evil feeling. Have you ever got goosebumps up your scalp where it feels like your scalp is shrinking? I did that night. So bad in fact it literally felt like someone had a hand on my head squeezing it. I was genuinely scared. Not so much for me, but for my son. Somehow I knew deep down if I turn away from my son, something bad will happen to him. I thought if I could turn on the light I could grab my son and leave the room. So where I was on the bed, I could just barely touch the plastic bezel thing on the light switch. I was afraid to move because I knew if I did whatever this thing is, it will get my son. His head was on my arm this whole time. So I finally chanced it. I jerked my arm out from my son and turned on the light. It honestly took a split second. When I turned back to grab him, he was at the bottom of the mattress. Like something had pulled him from the top to the bottom in a split freaking second. And I know he didn't crawl down there because he was still fast asleep. So I grabbed him up and we left the room and slept in the front room that night. Something evil wanted my child. That is truly terrifying. This thing that happened to me a while ago has been bothering me, and I need to get it off my chest. A few years ago I started having some still undiagnosed heart related issues, and so I had to stay in the hospital for a little over a month, and I would jerk awake at night to the sound of giggling children, but when I opened my eyes there was nothing there, just the darkness of night. One night I went to bed, and I dreamed that I had awoken, and there was a child in front of me, he kept pulling on my hand as if he wanted to show me something, so I got out of bed, and he pulled me out of my room and down the hall, and into the doorway of a boy who had just passed, we sat there and watched quietly as his mother cried, held by his father, as he was wheeled out of the room, the little boy gripped my hand even tighter, and he began to cry, I bent over and picked him up, hugging him for a little while, and then spoke, you need to be brave, for them pointing to his parents, he wrapped his arms around my neck and I walked into the room, until we were in front of them. I adjusted how I was holding him to help him look at his parents, 
and said, would you like to say goodbye as he waved goodbye and said, love you mama his mother looked up and began smiling. She was looking straight into my eyes, and she stopped crying only for a moment, as if she trusted in me to take care of him. When I looked back at him he had vanished, and his mother no longer looked at me, she looked past me. I went back to my hospital bed and laid back down, and went back to sleep. I woke up the next morning and never heard a laughter for the rest of my time in that hospital. I remember hearing nurses and doctors talk of the little boy who passed peacefully the night before, and how his mother swore there was an angel holding her child. Don't know if I believe that I helped a little kid pass through when nobody else could, but if I did then I'm glad. They never did find out what was wrong with my heart. Perhaps I'll get another opportunity to help a poor kid pass over. I believe I was comforted by an angel. I lived in a townhouse with my parents and older brother. My parents slept in the living room, and my brother and I each had our own room upstairs. On this particular night, I was dealing with intense pain from a gallstone lodged in my bile duct. I had told my parents over and over that something was wrong, and they chalked it up to just being constipation. They would get pee if I woke them up in the middle of the night, so I quietly sobbed, sitting on my bed alone with my door slightly cracked hoping they'd hear me and actually care this time. I cried for what seemed like a long time. I had my hands over my eyes and I just sat there bent over my knees just sobbing, begging any god to take the pain away. Suddenly I felt something sit on the bed next to me. I know I heard it. I could hear the blankets pulling and stretching, the way they do when you sit down on a soft mattress. I felt the bed sink next to me. In that exact moment, the pain literally melted away. I felt a level of peace that I had never felt before, kind of like when you lay on your bed. Finally, after a long day of hard physical labor, but multiplied by a thousand, I have never felt or experienced anything like that before or since, but it's something I will never forget. I believe someone, or something sensed I had no one, and that I needed comfort. I'm not religious, but I imagine this is what it'd feel like if God sent an angel down to comfort me during one of the hardest times of my life. If you are new my father's dead friend walked me home on Dia de los Mutas. I want to share this experience that happened to me around 15 years ago, when I started study in a town away from my parents home. There was one man, let's call him Tony, which was a good friend of my father, helped him at work sometimes, hence. I hanged out with them usually. When I was 17, I moved to a bigger city to start university, so I traveled every two months to visit my parents for long weekends or vacations. After my second year away, this friend, Tony, died from alcohol abuse. My father told me on a phone call how did that happen or at least how did he heard it happened. Around two months later, on Dia de Mutas, Day of the Death, here on Mexico, I went to visit my parents. Also to go and visit the tombs of the family as the traditions goes. And at this point I literally forgot about Tony's death. The apparition comes around because I didn't catch the bus that arrives during the day to my parents hometown. So I was forced to take one that arrives there around 2am. It is quite a small town. So since I didn't found any taxi near the bus station. I decided walk home. Around 5 blocks away from the house. I had to pass on a bridge where people say that a decapited donkey spirit scares people during the night, I was a bit scared tbh, but then, suddenly this friend, Tony, reached me on his bike, I didn't mention that he always moved on a bike, and asked me if I was just arriving from university, maybe because I was originally thinking about the decapited donkey I completely forgot about the fact that Tony was supposed to be dead, so I started to talk to him also. And we walked passing the bridge and a couple more blocks, for around 4 or 5 minutes, talking about the school, the food on the other city, and stuff like that. Just one block away from my parents house he just told me okay, I have to go check some things over here, pointing at another direction, but keep safe, say hello to your father for me. We said goodbye and then I got home. Since it was early morning, I walked directly into my room and waited to the next day to go and see my parents. It was until next morning, when I was just about to tell my father about Tony, that I remembered that he was already dead. At that moment I didn't tell to my parents, but a bit later into the day my father told me that he saw me arriving. He asked me if I was drunk or something because he saw me talking to nobody. 
So then I told him. I think it was some kind of company on that bridge that I was afraid of because of the stories, and also because of that scare. From the donkey story, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that my company was someone I knew was already dead. It is kind of funny for me, and actually never felt afraid of that moment. So thanks to that old friend that was there with me even after death. My dead cousin is bribing me. My cousin Lloyd passed away a couple of years ago. He had a bad relationship with his daughter, due to choosing his new wife, her stepmother, over her. His daughter never forgave him and poor Lloyd spent his last years desperately trying to apologize for his horrendous mistakes and make peace, and to try and meet his only granddaughter. Lloyd came to realize that family is everything. It's the only important thing in this life. Sadly he never did see his daughter or granddaughter. Lloyd would spend his holidays with my family instead. We loved him and tried to give him that family connection he was so desperate for. Last year I had an enormous fight with my mum and blocked her. About 2 months after that, things started going missing. It was just little things at first. Once every week or two, one of my favorite makeup brushes, my good hand cream, my favorite lipstick, my hairbrush, perfume, and worst, my engagement ring, just small, very personal items and only my stuff, and they were all items that have a designated place that I don't put down anywhere else. Over time it became more and more items and more and more frequently, until I'd put something down, and as soon as I'd reach for it again, it'd be gone. This was happening daily, it was driving me crazy, my house had become super active, for it, the footsteps could be heard at all hours, day and night, doors opening and closing, TV turning itself on in the middle of the night, the guitars strumming themselves, whispering, lights turning on and off, etc. I kept asking for my things back to no avail, then two of my dog's paperwork folders went missing. These folders contain all of my dog's important paperwork, pedigree papers, vaccination certificates, champion titles, etc. I breed and show my dogs, and right now I need both of these particular dog's folders, as one is about to be bred and the other needs her booster vaccination and I need her vax cert to take to the vet with me. I have 10 dogs, and keep these folders all together in my filing cabinet. Only these two were missing. Finally it clicked. Bloody Lloyd was behind this. I don't know why I made the connection. Perhaps I could feel it was him. IDK. At this stage I hadn't spoken to my mum in 11 months. And I knew that's what Lloyd was upset about. So I unblocked her number in my phone and told Lloyd to stop already. I'm doing it. A few days later I get a text from my mum and I answer it. We start talking again. The activity stops. Not another thing goes missing. The house is back to its normal level of activity. Not the freak show it had become. I start asking Lloyd for my stuff back. Nothing. A week goes by and it's my mum's birthday. I buy her a gift and go around to her place and have a visit. When I get home, I walk through the door and step on my missing engagement ring. You little beauty. Thanks Lloyd I say. Later that night I find my fav makeup brush on the floor of my bedroom. I vacuumed this morning. It definitely wasn't there then. Again thanks Lloyd. Yesterday I went out of town to do some Christmas shopping and as well as buying some presents for other people. I bought my mum a present. I came home and my two dogs folders were on the dining room table. There's nothing else on that table. Ever. So my dead cousin Lloyd is using theft and bribery to make me have a relationship with my mum. If you knew Lloyd, you'd know it was absolutely his style. Family is the most important thing. Skeptic for years until this morning. I work with one other person closely throughout most work days and today we get to work early as we knew we had to get stuff done before the snow hit. I work at a burial vault manufacturer and we deliver and set up funerals graveside if the customer wishes. Well on this morning I walk to the back and turn on the lights to each section of the shop and on the very last switch I turn it on and I see an older gentleman facing away from me leaning against the back wall facing the back of the shop. It startled me and I turned around to ask my co-worker that there's someone in the shop. My co-worker kind of laughs as I tell him and he says oh so you saw him didn't you? Apparently it's the owner's father who has strong ties to the workplace and has been dead for 10 years. Three recorded sightings of him and mine was the fourth. I'm fairly new there so this completely caught me off guard. I felt like I was dreaming. I had to sit in the bathroom for 10 minutes to calm down. 
I literally saw someone back there and then disappear. I've always thought ghosts and spirits will be a bit this has completely turned me sideways. I see life in a whole new way. I can't stop thinking about him though. Those blue overalls and white hair with a cap on. Clear as day right there and it was a ghost. My co-worker telling me he saw him too has turned me into a believer because I know I'm not losing my mind. I'm not from here. This has been a long time coming. Let me start off by saying this will be a long read. I'm also going to tell you that what I'm about to type is something I've carried with me for the last 24 years. And I haven't really spoken much about it since I was a child. And I've never spoken about it on any kind of public forum such as this. You are free to not believe me. I in fact, encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anyone. I'm typing this message because as I've gotten older and I've spent over two decades developing a life, to the best of my ability, I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that neither therapist nor psychiatrist treat as anything other than a method of repressing memories at best, and the delusions of a lunatic at worst. I do not blame you if you draw those same conclusions. I'm typing this in what I believe has become the most publicly traded speaking place on the internet for the sole purpose of attempting to drop the weight I've carried and move on with my life. This is more of a personal cleanse than an attempt at intrigue. And if no one reads this message and it becomes buried among the innumerable posts on Reddit, I will have at least gotten it off my chest. I am not from here. And by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I mean where any of us live. Anyone reading this, right now, it's now a few days after my 30th birthday, and this time of year always strikes me, because I started Kinjurgachan on my birthday, when I turned 5. I thought, at the time, everyone did that, you turned 5, and when you turned 5 you go to school. I didn't realize my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school, and a little over one year later, in about two weeks time. It will have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in San Diego, and lived in a poorer suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived at an apartment complex called Lemon Veen Apartments, that were a bit slummier versions of the Lemon Veen Apartments found in Lemon Grove, a suburb of San Diego. My parents were divorced, but friendly. My mother was was young when she had me, and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was aspiring to be a model and would regularly take trips to LA to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone, being one quarter Indian, Indian, not native, and it gave her an exotic look. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she would go to LA, and I would stay with my dad who worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly, and we even did Christmas together as a family even though they had split when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mom, who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six. So if there was drama behind the scenes they did a good job of hiding it from me. On the 17th of September, 1996, I was staying with my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. No horses or sheep or anything. But my grandma had several pet ducks that would eat seed from your hand, fly away and return every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week and my mom was in LA, so I stayed with my grandparents. Schools back then were pretty cool with this kind of thing. And I was sent home with the sorts of nonsense assignments you'd expect of a first grader who'd just gone back to school after summer break ended. The 17th was the third day I was staying with my grandparents. And my grandpa had told me to be careful outside. Because he'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it had went. So, since no one knew where the mystery snake had gotten off to, 6 year old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a 6 year old go looking around a farm for a rattlesnake was probably not in any parenting 101 handbook, but it was the 90s and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property but I wasn't allowed to go in there, so they probably figured that's where the snake had gotten off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this rattlesnake, and, much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, which, for those who don't have one, looks kind of like one of the green electrical boxes on the side of the road, 
There it was. Curled up. Rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut. And ran to my grandparents house to tell them I'd found it. Now this might be my 6 year old memory exaggerating. But I'm pretty sure that snake was at least 900 feet long. Give or take. I found it though. I was excited to tell my grandpa I found the snake. So he could. Do what he did. And go out and shoot the thing. I ran in the back door of the house. Which led you into the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room. Expecting to see my grandparents. My uncle. And the neighbor couple all sat in the living room where I'd left them. Except they weren't there. And it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. The hard and memorably uncomfortable hardwood furniture my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table he made out of a tree stump was gone. Replaced by fluffy grandma looking furniture. A three person sofa with a floral design on it. The TV was in the wrong place. And newer than my grandpa's old sit on the ground cabinet TV. The hardwood paneling on the walls was gone. Or at least covered by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy off white carpet. The pictures of my dad, my uncle, me, and my grandparents were gone from the walls. Replaced by paintings and pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by this, I was more confused by everyone being missing. In my 6 year old brain, I accepted that they may have completely rearranged the house while I'd spent the day looking for a snake. But I didn't believe at all that they'd all just leave me alone. And I didn't see anyone leave. I didn't see the cars go down the road. So I walked out the front door, which was attached to the living room, as they usually are, and thought maybe they'd gone to the chickens or the pigs. Both should have been visible from the front porch, but the chicken coop was gone, and the pig pen had lost its fencing, and there were no pigs to be found. At this point I was beyond confused, and I was getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't see anyone, even though they lived on a small farm. The neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road, so I ran down our own dirt driveway and across the road to their house, assuming that must have been where they went. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I remember starting to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house it used to be, it wasn't even the right house anymore. Nevertheless, I banged on the door. I remember that at this point I was crying quite profusely, because I didn't understand what was happening, and I kept wiping my face, which covered it in dirt after having been digging around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened, and a woman in her late 40s to early 50s answered, and I'd never seen her before, I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after this point is largely a blur, because nothing was right. I knew where I lived, I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived, but I met the people who lived where my grandparents lived, and they were not my grandparents. I did not know them. I begged for them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Through a series of various police and people in suits I was brought back to the town I lived in after spending what seemed like 10 hours in the local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home phone number memorized, but told them my dad would be asleep. But when they called that number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was, or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address, and sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went to my address. When they finally called the station back, they were informed that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Veen Apartments didn't exist, and the address I gave them was to an apartment complex called Merritt Manor and the apartment number I gave them was unoccupied. I believe at this point they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name of the apartments, and the wrong apartment number, but I did in fact live there. When I was finally brought to my hometown, after changing hands a couple times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my address again, and was driven to where I lived. That was it, that was my apartment complex. But, just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color in the sign that used to have a large image of a lemon reading lemon vein now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived, and just as they'd said, no one lived there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, or love who knew me, but none of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person who came out of the apartment buildings around me were the wrong people, 
and they didn't know me. From this point they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy, as he worked for the city, but no employee by his name apparently worked for the city in any capacity. As day turned to night, and I spent endless hours sitting in the police station as they attempted to find any person in the world who knew me, I couldn't do anything but cry, and cry, and cry, endlessly. A woman in a suit who I think was either a detective or just someone who happened to work in the station sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy that looked a bit like one of the dogs from 101 Dalmatians, and told me his name was Sparky. She said I could keep Sparky, and that when they found my parents, Sparky would go home with me and make sure I didn't get lost again. She said he was a good dog, and he'd protect me, if I took care of him. During this time they attempted my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. It was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived. But a school by such a name, you guessed it, did not exist. My school was now apparently called Anza Elementary. At one point I was asked if the police had ever taken my fingerprints. And they had. In kindergarten my entire class had our fingerprints taken by the police at the school gym. For basically exactly this reason. And surprisingly, this did not help, at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbors, my apartment, or even me. They couldn't even find me. I was too young to remember what my social security number was, but I severely doubt it mattered. They asked my birthday, and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing I told them turned up any information about me. At some point during the day I was briefly taken to the air, as the police suspected I may have sustained some kind of head injury. After being looked over by a doctor, they found nothing wrong with me, and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with someone that night, I'm not entirely sure who it was. Someone from child services I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening after this point. I'd cried myself to sleep several times in the police station and cried myself to sleep again at the house I stayed at that night. Despite the woman who I was staying with, not the same woman who gave me Sparky, doing everything in her power to calm me. I clung to Sparky so hard I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have my picture of my mom. I didn't know what was going on, and no one could find out where I belonged. This didn't make sense to me. I was only 6, and just barely. I lived where I lived and my parents were my parents and my school was my school. They didn't just all disappear one day. In between fits of crying and waking up I begged to go home. I begged for the lady I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go home. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times at different places at all hours of the day. Police, investigators, people from departments I still don't know, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station and the house I was staying at, until eventually someone told me that they thought they'd located my parents and they were coming to get me. Finally, I was going home. Finally, this was over. Finally, I could get away from all of these strange people asking me the same questions over and over again. When the couple showed up to the police station, my heart fell into my feet as they were not my parents. But they'd had a son that had gone missing, and I fit his description pretty closely. The woman started crying when she saw me, because she immediately knew I wasn't her missing son. But I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually I was collected by child services and I was taken to a foster family where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign, asking for anyone to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers, to put on the news. I never let go of Sparky for even a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo because I didn't have him when I arrived, but I needed him, and would throw an immense tantrum when someone tried to take him away. They had me put back on the clothes I was wearing when they found me, but they'd since given me new clothes to wear. In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was their child. I didn't realize this was what was happening until I was older and looked back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say is this your kid they were a bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing I was not their missing child, they'd often leave in tears. 
Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back. I feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain. Like a type of guilt. Like I wish I had been their child so they could have them back. And know they were safe. Most of those people probably never saw their children again. But I try and imagine that all of them were reunited. Even though I know that isn't likely. This guilt was one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult. But like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed what I've said. The most common belief suggested to me has always been that I was abandoned as a child and lived in an abusive home. Dumped on the side of a dirt road in the middle of farmland and I repressed all the negative memories I had of my past. I didn't stay in that foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I needed to start going to school, and I needed identification. I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year, but the day and month were listed as the 17th of September, the day that I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth. But I imagine it was because they didn't think I actually knew what it was. My name was unchanged. I started going to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists who had seen me recommended I not be placed back into a full curriculum immediately, and suspected I suffered some form of PTSD. I was put in the special class, and was only made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually I started going to school full time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually, I was placed up for adoption. I was never actually told I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after I was found it was, but eventually people started coming to meet me, but these people weren't looking for a missing child, they were looking to adopt one, but I definitely did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that no one believed or could verify. I insisted my parents would eventually find me, and I rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story doesn't have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18, and went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency and I did a brief stint in something similar to Juvie in San Diego called Chaparral. I never went to college and never really started getting my life together until I was around 24. I haven't talked publicly about this before now, at least not since I was a child speaking to everyone who was trying to figure out where I came from. I still have Sparky, he's old, and worn. Still in one piece, no longer white, he's now a dark shade of grey. He sits on my dresser, and is there, just like he always has been, as long as I've been here. So, Q&A. While I haven't publicly brought this up or spoken about it in any large scale fashion, I've told the story to people who wanted to listen and I've gotten one question, understandably, repeatedly, including from my shrink, so before you ask it, I'll try and answer it as best I can. Q. What things are different in the place you came from compared to where you are now? A. I'm not really sure. I've been asked about countries, states, laws, planets, languages. You name it. The fact is, I don't really know. I was 6. The continents could have been completely different and I'd have no idea. I wasn't particularly bright, either. I mean, I was hunting for rattlesnakes. I also thought California was a country. I can say, the president of the United States was not Bill Clinton. I can't remember exactly what his name was, but we had to learn it in kindergarten. I believe his name was Robert something or other. I want to say Robert Wilmer but don't quote me on that. Anyway, that's my story. I doubt anyone will read this, and it will likely be buried 10 pages deep in 15 minutes, but it's now off my chest, in the open, and I can go to sleep with hopefully a little bit of weight off. My grandfather visited me the night I made it one year sober. I have to explain some things first. My grandfather was an alcoholic. He began drinking during the war, World War II, at age 22 due to combat stress and got sober in his early 50s after immigrating to America. I never knew him as an alcoholic as he was well sober by the time I was born into this world but I had heard brutal stories from my mother and aunts. I always felt incredibly connected to him. My mother and aunt used to remark all the time about how similarly I carried my mannerisms and speech. I would and still do have unexplainable dreams of him and his experiences both during his life and after he passed. 
Once he had died, my mom and aunt would cry anytime I would remind them of him because of their own grief. Fast forward to my own life. I began drinking at age 18 and by 24 had developed a pretty bad drinking problem that directed me to several near death experiences and hospital trips. It was burning down everything it touched in my life. By the time I was 28 it had reached an all time low and I was finally at my wits end. My options were to quit or die or kill myself. One thing my grandfather did frequently when I was growing up was offer me loose change, usually pennies, as a joke and then promptly give me a crisp $20 bill as the big reveal. After he died I felt like I would find heads up pennies in strange places at odd times. Pennies I swore I didn't recognize as being there before. This became something my mother and I enjoyed reporting to each other about. It was a fun way to think of him although I am very skeptical of these kinds of things and not really a believer in the paranormal. Despite that, I loved calling my mom up to tell her that I'd find a heads up penny moments after getting a raise at work and other events of that nature. The night was the 9th of August 2018. My fiance and I were staying up waiting for midnight to come because at midnight I would finally finally be free of addictions bondage and have my first full year completely dry. It's something I could only have dreamed of before then. We were sitting on the couch reminiscing of the hard times and the good times. We were just holding each other and laughing, sometimes crying too. It was a wonderful evening. Finally my alarm on my phone went off signifying it was midnight and that my victory had arrived. About half a second to a full second after I silenced the alarm, we heard a coin hit the floor in the kitchen. It startled both of us. My fiancé in particular jumped because the house was silent. I got up and walked over to the kitchen and there on the floor seemingly grinning at me was a heads up penny. The shock and disbelief and feelings of utter warm joy cannot be described in this post. I felt as if my skeptic world and connection with reality had glitched in such a way that I had never experienced before and still have not experienced since. I sat down on the couch and immediately dialed my mother. To my surprise she answered immediately and said she had also been waiting up for midnight to come so she could call me and congratulate me. I stopped her abruptly and explained to her in sharp detail what had just happened and said I had my fiancé sitting with me as my witness. A silence came over the line followed by my mother sobbing into the phone. Oh daddy. Daddy. She sobbed into the phone. We both sat there on the line, crying, laughing and embracing the warm feeling of the moment. Ever since this night I have stopped finding pennies in strange places. I don't know fully what really happened but I sure do think of it every day. This August I will be 3 years bone dry sober and I am set to marry my best friend this summer. My dog barked a week after she died. Moxie was 14 years old. She was a pit mix. Sweet dog with lots of personality. On New Year's Eve 2020, she suffered a... Vestibular disease refers to a sudden, non-progressive disturbance of balance. It is more common in older dogs. It is also referred to as old dog vestibular syndrome and canine idiopathic vestibular syndrome. This happened while I was walking her and the other dog, Kuma, together. We were about half a block from the house when this happened. After the diagnosis on the 1st and the 6th of January, her health deteriorated, lost about 20 pounds, and refused to relieve herself outside. Even with a comfortable sling I had gotten for her to ease her walking, and to ease my back. She died on the 1st of February, around 9am. Sadness all around. A week later, on the 8th, we were in the kitchen making dinner when suddenly, her distinct bark of happiness was heard down the hallway, from our bedroom. One loud bark. This is something she would do on a regular basis to get our attention, so we could help her get on the bed. We both stopped what we were doing and stared at each other. The other dog looked down the hallway also. I said, that was Moxie, her, it was, me, she must be saying hello from the afterlife. We both, and Kuma, curiously went to the bedroom, turned on the light, and there was nothing out of the ordinary. Just the notion that she barked at us from the afterlife. My girlfriend and I are either crazy, or being severely harassed by something. As a warning, this is going to be a very long post. It may exceed the maximum characters, and as to follow the rules I may have to continue the story in the comments. I will try to be as concise, and organized as possible. This is my third draft trying to tell the story as neatly as possible. There has been many different events, 
and there are a lot of details to comb through. The reason I'm making this post is to share my experience, but also to possibly seek advice. This has reached a breaking point that has left me scared, and ready to possibly seek help. Be it a spiritual medium, an exorcist, or a psychologist. I believe that something is harassing myself, my girlfriend, my house, my family, and very importantly my children. I do not think this is a passive being, and every time something new happens I believe more and more that this is possibly dangerous. To give some backstory, I am 26, and my girlfriend is 22. We are going to call her B, because we like bees. B and I have been friends for many years, but we have only been dating for a little over a year. I have children from a previously failed marriage. They visit on the weekends. After the divorce I moved back in with my parents to restart and get back on my feet. I no longer live there, but I found this information relevant as it is where most of the story takes place. I often travel for my job, and this is also relevant, but not until much later in the story. To be sees things. She also hears things. She has described many horrifying visions and sounds. I knew that she experienced this, and while I have also had my own experiences I've never experienced anything like what she describes. I have never judged her for what she describes, and I have always kept an open mind. I believe in the paranormal, but I also believe in people needing psychiatric help. I have always thought that B's experience is a one or the other, but as for which one has always been irrelevant to me. I am here for her, and when the time comes that things reach a boil, that I will continue to be there for her. It did not take long after we started dating for me to also share some of her experiences. They started off very simple, and easy to brush off. Not feeling right in certain parts of the house. Feeling watched, seeing a shadow thing in my vision. These are the kinds of things that we naturally write off as tricks of the imagination, stress, or what have you, even though we'd both see it at the same time. She says that the things she usually sees are not of great detail. If she was to observe them she would never be able to make out details, nor make sense of words that she hears. No facial details, clothing details, anything of that nature. I don't know if this just means that they are pure black, or if they are more of a blur. She says there are two exceptions. Two things that she has seen repeatedly throughout her life, and they are the only two things that she's ever been able to make details out of. Tub man, and nose guy, I believe it is best to not give them names, but this is what she calls them, tub man she has seen in several houses, her childhood home, our friend's house, and others, she describes him as being skinny and lanky, and wearing red shoes, she has never seen his top half too well, or his face, because whenever she sees him he's already halfway in the tub, that's it, she'll see him crawling from the floor into the tub as if he was a spider, and she always catches those red shoes of his. I want to say she said he's in normal clothes, but I can't say for certain. The shoes are what stand out. Nose man on the other hand, she has only seen in her childhood home, and he's not so much a man, as he is a nose. I know this sounds silly, like some sort of Cronenberg monster, a giant fleshy nose man that just looks at her, and watches her, if he even has eyes, I'm not sure. Now I know this may not seem relevant, but trust me, I have tried to leave out any details that I find irrelevant. I'm now going to delve into our experiences together. When you enter my parents house there is a living room immediately in front. The kitchen to your left through the passway with the pantry and garage door. And stairs to your right. So left. Kitchen. Front. Living room. Right. Stairs. Stairs going up. And stairs going down. Upstairs is my sister's room. And my parents room. Downstairs is another small living space, a bathroom, and what became mine and B's room. I'm going to mostly skip over all of the smaller experiences of us not feeling right in that smaller living space downstairs. To be brief, until we had moved in it had went mostly unused, and shortly after we had moved in I had realized I did not like one particular corner of the room. Neither did B. There were a lot of times where we would find the lights on in closets downstairs when nobody was home, or in the middle of the night. Sometimes when we would pass by to go to the bedroom we would feel like something was rushing at us. The first real experience for both of us that I can remember that really had us freaked out was while she was using the bathroom. I was in the bedroom, 
which is directly next to the bathroom, lying in bed on my phone. It was about midday, and she had come back into the bedroom and asked what I wanted. I was not sure what she meant, and had asked her to explain. She had said I was knocking on the bathroom door, and was asking to come in. She had said it was locked, and she had asked me to wait. I had assured her that it was definitely not me, and that I would have heard someone knocking at the door. She seemed a bit frizzled, and had assured me that it was definitely my voice. Jumped to us both showering one day. We had wrapped up, and gotten dressed in the bathroom. She went to leave, and said something is holding the door shut. I was in disbelief, so I came over and turned the handle firmly but slowly, and opened the door. It barely had cracked open before, and I swear on my life. The handle very firmly twisted the other way in my freaking hand and had pulled shut. I immediately swung the door open and rushed out of the bathroom to confront whoever was there. But of course, there was nobody there. This is almost a year ago now, but if I'm trying to keep a chronological order I believe this is what happened next. I was off at work, and she was still in bed. She had heard my computer chair creaking multiple times. She felt someone was in the room and had pulled the blanket up over her head a bit and taken a peek. She later described to me a pale and gaunt woman sitting in my chair, smiling, smiling, and staring at her. I do not remember if she said there was something unnatural about her smile, but I believe it seemed like a large smile. Also, she had eyes. Not blank. Not black. I do not recall what color her hair or eyes were, as I am colorblind and that detail did not stick with me. My ears work. My eyes don't, but regardless I don't remember, though, if I recall her hair was not black, and it was a lighter color such as blonde or a soft brown, long and thin, I wish I had asked more about this woman, such as what she was wearing, or any descriptive features. B seemed very stressed out about this incident, so I did not push for any more details. The reason this stressed her out so bad was because she could see the woman, it wasn't like all the other times. She was like nose guy, and tub man, she could see every detail of her, she turned back over, pretended to sleep, and waited for me to get home. I did not see her, before covid had gotten too bad, and as being ignorant of how bad it was going to be we had taken a trip to Michigan. The whole family, except for my sister, she had stayed behind and watched the house, and fed the animals. We were gone for the week, and B and I had gotten home the following weekend before my parents. It was already late at night, we were unpacking the car, and she had ran inside. I kept unpacking, but was suddenly overwhelmed with this sickening feeling of being watched. It was worse than any time before, and for some reason I kept looking to the side to the house that led around to the back of the house. I eventually had grabbed some luggage, and rushed inside. I had gotten inside, and closed the front door. Immediately my attention was drawn to the window in the back. I couldn't see anything there, but it felt like something was looking right back at me, just out of sight in the darkness, and then I had noticed, to my right, one of our cats was also sitting and just staring at the window. I tried snapping my fingers, and saying her name, she didn't even flick her little ears, she just stared. B had come back upstairs, and we went outside to grab some more luggage. I had mentioned to her that I felt like I was being watched. I had not mentioned the window, but then she immediately jumped in and said she felt like someone was watching her from the back window. We hurriedly got everything inside, and talked to my sister. We asked her how the week was, and she said everything was fine. We noticed that she was in her room, and while that makes perfect sense for any teenage girl to be sitting in her room, it isn't like her. She always sits in the living room, surrounded by all the animals, and watches YouTube videos on the TV. We asked her if anything seemed strange while we were gone, but we were very vague. She too, had filled in the blanks, even pointing to that same window. She said she had not left her room any more than she possibly had to in the last few days because suddenly she felt like she was being watched from that window. We eventually grabbed flashlights, and investigated the backyard, obviously to no avail. So we moved on. The next event seems strange to note, but just like everything else, Bear with me, there's a reason I'm taking note of it. While I was staying with my parents I unfortunately didn't have a bed for both of the children. They both slept on the same bed. Really it was a pull out mattress from the sofa, in the downstairs living space. Yeah, it's not an amazing setup, 
but I was trying to do what I could to just see my girls. I would set them up at night in that bed and give them each one of their favorite stuffed animals, and I'd let them watch TV with almost no volume just to help them fall asleep. I'm aware that I really shouldn't let them have the TV on when they are sleeping, but I sympathize with the idea of being scared of the dark. As an adult, I still sleep with the TV on, or rather at least some noise like a fan, music, or some kind of light. I don't like tea or dark on top of pure silence. Maybe I'm a scaredy cat, but the point is I'll let the girls keep the TV on. Okay, maybe some of that detail is unnecessary, but it's my story to tell. My youngest daughter is known to get up and seek out an adult for no real reason other than probably comfort. She doesn't come crying, scared, or anything of that nature. She just kind of gets up, finds an adult, and is like, hey, can I hang out here too but not in so many words. To which, you usually just have to tell her it's bedtime and to go lie down. She'll go right back to bed. It's just something she does. So one night we had noticed that more than usual she did not seem to want to stay in bed. Usually, she'll just knock on the door, and I'll send her back to bed. And this happened a couple of times. But the only time she would go upstairs was if she heard someone else such as my dad. So on this night, with her continuing to get out of bed, we wanted to know if there was a particular reason. So we had our lights off, and we had cracked the door. We were keeping an eye on her, and after a short period, we seen her get up again, we didn't hear anything, or see anything that would have made her get up and check if someone was there, but she walked over to the bottom of the stairs, and just stared up the stairs, for a really uncomfortable amount of time. We watched her, unsure what to do, obviously, we knew we needed to put her back down, but I think we were just curious if she was just going to turn around and knock on the door again, or go lie back down herself. There is. And I need to stress this, almost no lights upstairs. I mean, you can't really see anything. Everyone is asleep. There's not a single sound. The only glow of light is not from the middle floor, but the upstairs hallway. She starts climbing the stairs. It's a short set of stairs, but she's climbing. She reaches the top, and B and I slowly open the door, and come out, as quietly as we possibly could. We climb the stairs after her. She had went through the small passageway in between the pantry and the garage into the kitchen. And she's just freaking standing there, in the dark. We can barely see her. She's standing in the middle of the kitchen, and staring into the blackness towards the corner of the kitchen by the window above the sink. Take note of the window above the sink. After an uncomfortable amount of time we say her name, and she jolts a bit, turns around, says hi and comes up and gives me a hug. We asked her if something's wrong and what she's doing. She quite literally shrugs her little shoulders, points to the kitchen window area, and then puts her head on me. So we take her downstairs, put her to bed, and we don't sleep right away until the uneasy feeling passes. Again, trying to keep things chronological. The next incident I can think of happened in the middle of the day while my girls were visiting. My girls are very young, but I'm not going to disclose their ages. I will say one of them is young enough to not quite make coherent sentences, but she does love to talk. The older of the two is no longer a toddler, she's a kid, and before I know it, she'll be a teenager. My dad, B, and I were outside putting together a swing set for my kids, which if you've ever put one together then you know that it's not as fun as using the swing set. It's actually quite a hassle. And it was taking a lot more time than we had thought it was going to. Admittedly, I don't recall where my mother or my sister were, but I do recall that they were not there. So we had set the children up at the kitchen table with some kinetic sand and legus. Figured that could be some good messy fun for us to clean up after building the swing set. We would work on the swing set, and go in to check on the children from time to time. I should note that the children can see us from the window, and we could see them. The window was even open. B suddenly described feeling sick to me, like something wasn't right. So I asked her to check on the children, and kept on with the swing set. She went in, and was immediately struck with an even worse feeling. She asked my oldest daughter where her sister was, and she said she went upstairs with Mormor, my mother. My mom isn't freaking home. Even writing that out made me feel nauseous, probably because my children are involved, 
B ran upstairs, and she described feeling a weird sensation. As she describes it, when she was talking to my daughter she couldn't hear anything else. But as she reached the top of the stairs she could very clearly hear my younger daughter screaming and crying that she wanted out. She tried the door, and it was locked. She ran downstairs to get a buttock knife, and rushed back up, unlocked it, went inside, and she had to unlock my parents bathroom door as well. She got her out, and held her. She said she had dried tears on her face, but she couldn't have been gone that long. We were constantly keeping an eye on them through the window even as we worked on the swing set. And B said she could hear her yelling the whole time all of a sudden after she reached the top of the stairs. All the way back in the kitchen she could hear her. Why couldn't she before? And why hadn't my older daughter heard her the whole time? Not to mention she knows how to lock and unlock doors so how did she end up in that situation in the first place? Did she just start to panic? And couldn't get the door unlocked? I still think about my daughter saying she went upstairs with more more. I feel like something is luring my daughter. And the idea of that woman that be seen makes me feel freaking sick. I just thought of a detail that's kind of important for later. My parents have the master bedroom, of course. They have their own bathroom attached, and then from the bathroom is how you enter their closet. It's a walk-in closet. It's a very strange setup since it's somewhat of a series of doors, and it's kind of bougie. But hey, it's not my house. Some time passes, and my brother and his wife visit. Everything goes as normal, and it's a good time. We play some Animal Crossing, and we all hang out. They're getting ready to leave, and somehow spooky stories are brought up. They were brought up by my brother's wife. Just fun stories. But we start telling them about some things that we've experienced in the house. They exchanged glances in an almost cartoon fashion. My brother's wife then asked us to go outside. I was puzzled, but we went outside. She then elaborated that she was afraid someone was in our house, and she did not want them to hear us, like a squatter in our attic or something. They began sharing stories of how bothered they have been in the past at this house. These were all before we had moved in, some of which I don't recall, and at the time I could not relate to. Some others were similar to our experiences in that the same closets and the same rooms would have their lights on with the doors closed, and some doors would open or close when they weren't looking. Three of the stories stood out to be and I so I will briefly tell those. First, my brother was playing the new Star Wars game on his PS4 downstairs. His wife was upstairs. He had seen someone in the corner of his eye walk down the stairs, and go in the bathroom and close the door. They had turned the light on as well, but after they closed the door, he had assumed it was his wife. His wife was still upstairs, and when he had realized that she had opened the bathroom door, and nobody was in it, this is bothersome because it is the same bathroom where B had heard my voice when I wasn't there, and where something had turned the handle and closed the door when B and I were trying to open the door. Second, they were feeding the animals while the rest of the family was out of town. Again, we did not live there yet, so my parents and my sister were out of town. They were feeding both dogs and both cats all weekend long. Randomly, in the middle of the week they could no longer find one of the cats. They had searched all over the house. Finally, they had gone upstairs and checked my parents room. They had run out of options, but they had not checked it previously because they had no reason over the whole weekend to go into my parents room. The cat was not in my parents room, nor was it in the bathroom. It was in the freaking closet. You remember that setup I mentioned earlier? How does a cat go through three doors, and get stuck in the closet when nobody is home? This situation bothered me because it reminded me of what happened with my younger daughter. It's also a good time to note that we constantly find the cats in the closets. Sometimes we don't even let them out. For example, when everyone in the house is sleeping, but her and I, we play hella games all night. We would go to the middle level to get food, hear a door click open. Look upstairs and see the male cat walk out of the towel closet very nonchalantly. This has happened three different times. Nobody let him out. The door just opens, and he walks out. Third story from my brother and his wife, and this one is kind of simple. They were house-sitting a game as they often did for my parents. My brother was staying up playing games on his laptop, and he had went outside to smoke. He was sitting on the bench outside. And this bench is right outside of the kitchen, towards the back of the house. He had been there for some time, 
and the light from the kitchen window was shining across the ground. He said a woman had walked into the window, and she was just standing there in the window. He said it scared him because he knew it was not his wife. The silhouette did not look like her, and he knew she was asleep. When he finally mustered up the courage to stand up and take a look in the window there was nobody there, that the shadow was gone. When he had went back inside he had confirmed that his wife had been sleeping the whole time. The reason the story bothers me as well is because that window would be the window where my daughter was staring in the middle of the dark of the kitchen that night. One experience my sister was a part of was when I was on my way to work. I got a text from B. She was still in bed, but all it said was, something is in the room, and a follow up message about things getting knocked over, and she's too scared to get out of bed. It's like 5.30am, and still dark. I knew my sister would be up that early because, well, she's unhealthy, much like us. So I called her, and asked her to go check on B. She went downstairs, and turned the light on. When she did she seen that my fan was knocked over, and all the stuff on my dresser was knocked over as well. This is all on the opposite side of the room where B is in bed. So they fixed everything, and kept the lights on until the sun came up. There are only two more stories before we are caught up with the present moment. Both of these stories are the most recent, and they have both happened in the past 30 days. But they both concerned me, because they both tie all the events together, but also make them all much harder to understand. As I had said before, I travel for work, especially right now as the area of Indiana that I'm in is considered a red zone for COVID. So all the local work has pretty much shut down. So about a month ago we were on our way to a job in Georgia. There's not much to really set up for what happened because it happened very suddenly. We've been driving for many hours already, but we weren't overly tired or anything. We always stop for naps in the car, or anything like that if we think we're getting too tired on a long road trip. We've been driving on the highway for most of the trip, but as we're getting close to the destination the GPS had taken us off onto some local roads for the rest of the trip. Which we found odd because I didn't think Albany was that off the beaten path. We had gotten onto a decent stretch of road in the backwoods of Georgia on our way to Albany, but we still had a ways to go. We both had started to feel a little off about the road we were on. Nothing too specific, but just that feeling that creeps up on you, you know? Realizing that I could always turn on my bright since I'm no longer on the highway, and maybe it would help us feel a little better to be able to see more of what's around us I decided that that was what I would do. No sooner than had I turned on my lights I could see something on the side of the road. It was coming out of the woods, and towards the road, I could not make out what it was, and then we were passing it. As we had gotten closer and I was able to distinguish it more I can only describe it as a grey, even for my eyes being somewhat color blind. Human sized, fleshy, shaking thing. Not shaking like a bag blowing in the wind, or fabric caught on a tree. Besides, I had clearly watched it come from inside the woods. It was shaking like it was having a convulsion. You ever see the Silent Hill movie? Remember that thing on the road that attacks the cop lady? Like a person gift wrapped in their own skin? Like that. But less person and more shaky. Same color though. I instantly asked if she had seen what I had just seen. And she was thoroughly freaked out. And described exactly what I had seen. She said it looked like it was the same fleshy material that nose guy always was. Now, this part is strange to me because it's a bit of a departure from everything else we've experienced. It seems entirely unrelated to everything else, besides her relation to nose guy. But it's important to me because it's the first unexplainable thing I've ever seen for myself. Every story until now has happened around me. I have felt them. Everyone's stories keep matching up, and I did feel something close the door. But this was the first thing I seen with my own eyes. My dumb butt needed closure so I actually turned the car around to go check what it was. But there wasn't anything there. No semi truck tarp caught on a tree. No amalgamation of small garbage bags creating a larger scarier garbage bag. And no spooky silent hill monster. I was a bit shaken though. Now this is the last and most recent story. I'm currently in Pasco, Washington. Another job. It was, all together with naps and food stops, over a two day drive. We made the usual rest stops off the toll road at those designated rest areas. Everything was totally normal, but at one of the rest areas we had split and went in our own respective rest rooms. Myself to the men's, 
and her to the ladies room. I had gotten out before her, and was checking out the snack machines. Which, Wisconsin, why do you have cheese curds, and pickles in your snack machines? Anyway, when she came out I had taken note that she came out of the ladies room on the opposite side of the rest area. I didn't think too much of it, but I did notice it. She seemed off, but we kept moving on. Thinking back, I should have asked her if she was alright. Rest areas can be shady, so we drove for another day, and we were about 6 hours away from our destination. I remember looking at the woods next to us, and remembering the thing we had seen in Georgia. I got thinking about everything, and I had asked her if it was relieving that I had seen it as well. My logic here is that she's always questioned herself, and the things she sees. Since she's the only one that has seen them, I think that's natural. She said that it's relieving that I seen it, but it also terrifies her because it makes her wonder if everything else is in her head or if they're all real. She said if they're all real then she doesn't want to be alive anymore. Which, is super heavy, but I don't blame her. If she's seen things like what I had her whole life then I don't know if I'd want to continue either. So I got thinking about everything again. And I asked her out of nowhere if she thought that woman she saw was what lured my daughter upstairs. She started panicking. I mean, scared for her life. She started crying. And telling me no. 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 Don't talk about her. She was so afraid. She started looking in the back of the car to make sure she wasn't in the car. This idea. And her panic. Terrified me too. Of course. She told me through her tears, that the previous day at that rest area when she had went into the first women's room that when she went around the corner and looked in, that she was there. She slowly lifted her head above the wall of the stall, and looked right at her. I assume with that same smile she told me about before, but I can't say for certain. I didn't want to ask, I just tried to calm her down. She didn't want me to talk about her, or bring her up. She thought that even the fact that I had thought about her and mentioned her wasn't a coincidence. I reassured her that it was, but it made me question it as well. We haven't spoken about that in so long that it is pretty coincidental. The reason it terrified her so much was because this is the second time she's seen her. Only tub man and nose guy have ever been repeating. Now she is too. The idea that something like that could follow us out of state scared me more than anything. That's really all I've got. I've spent pretty much all day typing this up, and trying to make it coherent. I don't know if anyone is really going to get through all of this, but I'm kind of desperate. I need to know if anyone has had similar experiences, if anyone knows anything about this, if we need a medium, or if we both need psychiatric help. I don't know what to do. There are so many little details, and bits and pieces that I've probably missed. I've done the best I could to try and explain everything I found important. I hope I haven't forgotten anything to big. Thank you for reading if you've made it this far. Also, unrelated, but if anyone is concerned about how much we travel during these times, we very much keep to ourselves. We distance from everyone that stops, keep to ourselves at home, and my work is on oil tanks. The only people I run into are on my crew. I cannot provide evidence of any of the things we've seen. Only pictures of animals, the house, points on the map, pictures of the places we've been, even being in Washington right now. Basically, I can back up every detail of my life, except the paranormal part. I guess if that was easier then everyone would believe though, wouldn't they? Thanks for your time, and please help me. When I was a kid I used to sleep at the morgue when mom had shifts. At one night we kept hearing a typewriter coming from the autopsy room. There was no one else with us that night, and definitely no typewriter in the building. I was in rehab in 2006. The place was an old morgue and had a horrible vibe. I was trying to sleep and I could just feel something in my room. It was so uncomfortable, and I knew something was there, but I didn't want to see what it was. It was probably 3-4 am, after what felt like forever. I opened my eyes and just looked above me, and I could see three shadows in the shape of humans or something moving around my room. I couldn't see faces or anything, just could see the shapes and they were moving around my room and above me, like watching me. It was the longest night of my life. So many unexplainable things happened in that place, but that was a bad night. I have no idea who or what they were, and they didn't do anything to me besides hang out in my room looking at me. Creepy. I went to rehab in what was previously an old folks home, 
knocking in my room all night long all over the room. Freezing cold spots, as if coming off drugs isn't bad enough. I was doing laundry in the basement one afternoon. My son was downstairs with me, playing with his toys. He always liked to play down there and rarely ever hung out in his bedroom on the third floor. When I carried the basket back up the stairs, I met my husband on the main floor. He excitedly approached me and said, Guess what? Our son is actually playing in his room to which I replied, No he isn't. He's playing in the basement. My husband runs all the way down to the basement, all the way up to the third floor and then back to me, looking pale as a ghost. He explained that when he went up to the third floor, he almost opened our son's bedroom door to put away some laundry, but heard him jumping around and making his superhero noises to himself. He saw the light on and from under the door saw the shadows of his feet moving. He decided it was best to let him be and opted not to open the door after all. We both went up there. Door shut. Lights off. Son in the basement. Who? Or what? Was in his room. 15ish years ago my husband's very close friend killed himself. After the funeral I was home with our two very little kids while my husband was out with family and friends at a bar. After sobbing most of the night I decided to compose myself so I could be supportive when he got home. I tried on a pair of pre-pregnancy pants and was poking my leg and telling myself I was too fat to wear them when my flip phone started ringing in my back pocket. I had paid to have my ringtone be no rain by blind melon. But when it rang this time at Muwued, I could see that it was my husband and it said no rain was playing. I let it ring three time in my hand and it was Muwuing at me. I was almost giggling when I finally flipped that phone open and we agreed it was a very just in thing to do. After we talked I searched for a moo ring tone and couldn't find anything. Not even to purchase. And I kept the pants on. They did fit. Thanks for mocking me one last time buddy. This happened a few years ago. I've shifted houses since then. My mom, sister and I were at home and it was like 7 in the evening. Late winter evenings. So it got dark soon. Here, we were living in a flat, on the 4th floor, so the layout was basically, in the hall. On the left you had the wash basin, an empty room beside it, and on the right was my parents room. So it's 7 in the evening, and I'm in my room and there's some problem and the electricity went off suddenly and it turned really dark. Now we had to go out, so I had picked out clothes and they were in my left hand. I'm calling out to my sister and mom to get the phone or flashlight, anything. No one replies. So I walk out of the room and I'm touching the wash basin. You know how you hold on to something if it's dark. I am calling someone out to bring the phone. My left hand has the clothes and is also holding the basin. Now suddenly, I feel my sister's hand sort of trace my right arm and interlock with my fingers. The weird thing here was that she wasn't replying. So I'm blabbering. I could feel myself continuously talking, but not able to stop telling her. Why are you holding me? Get the phone. I need to change. Why aren't you replying? We'll get late. I'm saying all this, over and over. She holds my hand for a good one minute and I'm blabbering the entire time. Now she suddenly lets go, and the next second, the lights switch back on. There is no one around me, and my mom's room is pretty far. I mean no one can walk into her room in the split second the light switched on. My mom and sister walk out of there, all concerned, asking me what I was saying, and how they were yelling over and over that they're trying to look for a phone flashlight. When I was blabbering with the hand, it was silent. It didn't even seem someone was in the house with me. I thought it was a prank. I was terrified and they swore they were in the room the entire time, together and hadn't walked out in the hall, even once was sitting in the main area of the house we used to live in, open plan layout, there was a countertop between the kitchen and the rest of the room. The bench tops were pretty high, so no chance my toddler could have done this, and husband was in the other half of the room. So I'm just minding my business and for some reason decide to turn and look behind me. As I did, I saw my pillar candle which I kept in a decorative bowl just lifted up in the air and clattered into a pile of dishes that was nearby. Thing had to be a good 6 inches off the bench top. Later after we moved the same candle took a leap of faith off the top of a bookshelf and ended up splitting down the middle. All of this only ever started happening after I brought a framed piece of artwork home from a second hand shop. So, really weird. I made an offering of milk honey and chocolate to it just for kicks and curiosity's sake. 
and haven't had anything weird happen since. So, painting ghosts like chocolate and hay cheaply made candles I guess. Unless they wanted you to light the candle for them, like the offerings. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia about 3 years ago. I have experienced stuff I couldn't even imagine before. I had strange encounters with really strange people. I saw signs and meaning in everything. I was literally terrified so often I can't even find the words to describe what happened. I think, the scariest truly paranormal encounter I had, was, when I felt the presence of some kind of universal conscious being. Not really for me but something freaky happened to my son when he was 13 years old. My son had broken his leg a few weeks before the experience happened. He was laying on the couch downstairs and I was upstairs in my room asleep. I woke up to him calling for me at like 2 or 3 am. So I went downstairs to see what was up and he said he was watching a video on his phone and he heard a voice whisper really loud in his ear say boo he also seen some shadows going up and down the stairs too. We were both freaked out so I stayed downstairs on the other couch. LOL. It was terrifying at the time, but looking back it could have ended way worse for me. I was 5 stroke 6 and woke up at midnight exactly, had a digital clock by my bed, and walked out of my bedroom into the adjacent hallway. I heard someone in the living room and expected my stepdad or mom. I walked into the kitchen and watched as a tall man in a suit with an old hat walk through my parents bedroom door. He looked at me and in a voice that simultaneously sounded like angels and the devil himself. Said him only here for your parents. Smiled and his eyes started to glow from behind his pitch black glasses. He walked past me and disappeared before he touched the front door. Even today I'm religious. I don't know whether I saw a ghost, demon, angel, or the devil himself. Sadly not as scary as some people's are. My grandma's house had 5 levels. And she had a ghost, pretty harmless, would hang out during the day in the basement lower basement area. The creepy part to it was one day my family had to stay at my grandparents. Everyone had a room besides me. I got stuck on the middle floor on the couch, right near the basement door. And turns out she comes up at night. And she would hang in the kitchen. And stand right in the doorway where the stairs up to the kitchen were and the stairs to the bedrooms were. I was several feet from the stairs to kitchen. She never did anything but I felt her presence almost the whole night just staring at me. I didn't attempt sleep till the sun came up. This happened quite recently. I'm honestly not too scared of it now because I'm always home alone and I got used to horror somewhat. So I was awake around 2 to 3 am only me and my mom are home. If not for my dog staring at the door for 30 minutes I wouldn't have cracked my door open. He's kind of my watchdog. I'm just watching YouTube minding my own business. And out of the corner of my eye I see a white figure through the crack in the kitchen next to the hallway. I don't think much of it because I thought it was my mom. But about 10 minutes later I realize she doesn't wake up at 2. She wakes up at 4 and I would have heard her footsteps since there are a bunch of creaks. So this kinda spooked me so I just went back to my videos. An hour later I see another figure but it was black. The light was on. No dang face. I could see it just standing there either staring at me or the oven. Again didn't hear footsteps and my mom doesn't wear black. Then I started walking into the hallway towards the front door. And my dumbass decides to go check it out. But obviously jack crap was there. Freaked me the frick out at the time but as the days passed I stopped thinking about it and just went on. But kinda whack to see a white and black figure. Can't really remember if the white figure was more grey or white but oh well. A weird orb of light at top of a mountain. Was fooling around with a girl in my car at the time. This orb of light appeared behind us. First thought it was a flashlight or something. But it gave us the creeps. Ruined the mood and we got out of there. Thing is, I drove down the mountain and the freaking orb of light kept up. It was bright but didn't illuminate the trees and crap around it. The girl kept telling me to drive faster and I was trying not to crash. Couldn't keep my eyes off the rear view mirror. Possible it was a tailgating car. Managed to get to the bottom and the moment I hit residential streets, the light disappeared. Either way, it shook us both. She didn't want anything to do with me after that night. Feeling was mutual. Felt a surge to just put distance between me and that event and she reminded me of it. Cockblock from beyond the stars. Hallway light came on by itself few days ago. I was downstairs and awake surfing the web on my phone. 
My wife and daughter were both upstairs. The year 2011 PE class 7th class middle school. We are sitting outside of the school teacher was showing us some movements. There was another school in front of us. 260 foot. I saw a black long woman figure at the door staring into us. School was closed but you can enter to school. I told my friends none of them saw the ghost, I guess. I decided to go in when I entered I felt cold and I get goosebumps also there was some kind of wind coming from my back and I freaked out and run. The worst thing about that was, last year a girl died in school on the same day it was the 7th of March 2000. It was a homicide or natural cause if I remember it right. Didn't happen in school. There's someone breathing on my face in the middle of the night. And there's no one there. No it isn't a air current it's the sound of someone breathing and it's no my face. It stops after a couple minutes and I can sense they left. I don't know what it is and it's still happening. Help. Next time you feel that crap. Spit directly at the direction you feel it at. Teaches them you ain't gone take that shit. I put the loaf on bread on the board. Then returned to the shopping bag to unpack the rest. As soon as I took my hand away from the board, a glass jug fell off it and broke. I had never ever touched that jug, so not possible that I had improperly placed it. I checked the board, it was completely stable. Not possible that it moved when placing the bread. I inspected the site. No way it could be triggered by the wind of my hand moving or by my hand accidentally touching something. Checked the seismographs, no activity. Checked the windows, all closed and no wind outside anyway. WTF just happened? My brother once touched an thick butt mug with only ambient temp water in it to drink and it breaks as soon as he touched it and I am the only witness. Our family was mad at him for not bring careful but it's so clear that he didn't even have a chance to lift it or anything. 1. My brother had decided to explore an abandoned school that was home to a lot of demon worship and brought one home to our house. Worst 3 weeks I've ever had. 2. Had our home spirit been here 13 plus years leave hickeys on my neck for a few months, still occurring. 3. Was getting our house blessed after the first incident when doors were just randomly open and closed for about 3 minutes. 4. I was outside playing cops and robbers at like 11pm with my friends and there was a man who ran but it seemed like he would teleport about a foot in front of his step. Basically imagine every time you take a step, you just teleport forward. That's what he did. None of my friends had ever seen anyone else that night. 5. Was staying up late waiting for Santa with my mom's then boyfriend's kids and suddenly a head popped up through the floor. I can only tell you one thing. They are real. I don't know what they is. Aliens. Ghost. Demons. Future humans. Multidimensional beings. ETC. I don't know what they are but I saw it. I didn't ask it what it was. So I don't know what it was. I mean how can I claim it's a ghost if it didn't tell me? We don't want previews. We want stories. When I was 8-9 years old I walked through a tunnel only people could go through and a lot people died in because of shootings. I was walking and since the tunnel had no lights I saw my shadow and I saw it change into different objects. The first shadow I saw was an individual was behind me but there was no one in the tunnel but me. When I looked back at my shadow it disappeared and was replaced by an inflatable armed man. I ran out of that tunnel and never walked through it again. Possible, but I'm not sure. It was pitch black. I don't know how good you'd have to be to control a drone, chasing a car downhill and be at its rear and avoid trees. It was a forested lane going down the side of a mountain. One time I really had to grow a monkey tail. I went in, did the job, which felt like a solid 8-10 incher, only to look in the bowl and see a pond of placid crystal clear water. No turds to be found. Still sends shivers down my spine. It was Halloween. I dress up as Karl Bruflovsky. I was 12, so anyway, me and my friend and our parents knocked on this specific house. My friend said hello, I'm a fairy. The door opened and I see this person with a smile from ear to ear. Haha <laughs> yep I have no idea what that was. Also I lost my black shoes from that. A black, humanoid thing was in my room when I was asleep. I usually have very vivid dreams a few times a week. And eventually these turned lucid. It became a habit that, if I didn't like the outcome, I would fall back to sleep and live the dream until I got the desired outcome. 
I can usually do this up to 3 times for the same dream until I'm too awake to do it anymore. So I'm no stranger to weird or scary dreams. Anyway, it was hot one night, and me and my partner slept with our window open. I also am very scared of the dark, so I always slept with the TV on. When the TV goes into standby, the screen turns a very bright blue. We lived with my parents at the time, since we were only students, and they were asleep in the room next to ours. I woke up in the middle of the night, around 2.33 am, and I sat up because I saw a black figure in front of the bed. I don't mean a black person, but a little black figure, as if someone was wearing a black morph suit. I could see no facial features whatsoever and it didn't seem to be wearing clothes. Just plain, smooth, black skin. With the blue light of the TV as a backlight, the figure stood strangely. It was a very exaggerated pose as if it was reaching up but froze when I saw it. Typically, in a situation where I'd see a person stood in my room, I like to think that I would protect myself and fight, but I had no emotion towards it. I just slowly laid back down, pulled the duvet above my head, and closed my eyes. I remember I was shaking violently. I assumed this was because I was scared. But I didn't feel frightened. The next day, I woke up and nothing was missing. I assumed it was just a vivid dream or even a hallucination. I don't think it was sleep paralysis because I could still move freely. Anyway, I went downstairs and decided not to tell my mum about what happened. Because she gets frightened easily. But she then asked me did you and your boyfriend go out last night I said no and asked why. She said I heard the front door open about 2am. And then someone walked through the house and opened the back door. I assumed it was you taking the dog outside. So, for the layout of our house, someone would have to enter through the front door, walk through two other doors before being able to get out of the back into the garden. I decided to tell her about my dream, and it is safe to say that she freaked out and told my dad, who then proceeded to check all the doors and windows and the attic. I still, to this day, do not know what I saw that night, and I don't know what would have happened if I didn't wake up. We still sleep in that same room, and nothing like that has happened since then. P.S. Sorry for the long post. I just needed to tell people my scariest experience. You can have sleep paralysis hallucinations without the paralysis. My sister has that, she has narcolepsy. It's happened to me as well. I have sleep apnea. I also have the cycle of vivid lucid dreams. You might have a sleeping disorder. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.